I'd like to call to order the April 12th, 2022 meeting of the school board. Let's start with a roll call. Sure. Uh, our, welcome to our SAU 50 representative, Pat Walsh. Welcome. Liz Barrett. Here. Pip Clues. Here. Lisa Rappaport. Here. Ann Walker. Here. Margo Peabody. Here. Nancy Clayberg. Here on Zoom. She's a panelist. She should be able to talk. Sounds like uh, she's muted. Nancy, are you here? Yes. All right. <laughs> Hope Van Epps. Here. Brian French. Barry Nolte. Here. Kimberly McGlinchey. Here. Nick Dowling. Here. Great. Let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's uh, move to the acceptance of the minutes from our March 22nd meeting. Do I have a motion to accept? Move to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion? Um, my name was omitted from the uh, members present. Okay. Oh. Other, other discussion items? So motion passes. All right. At this point in the meeting, we can move to public comment. We're going to welcome public comment to those members of the audience that are here in person first, and then we can turn it over to those members of the audience that are present on Zoom. Uh, if you would like to speak, you have three minutes, and you need to state your name and your address. Okay. Thank you, Chairperson Margo Peabody and members of the board. My name is Emil Boussier. I live at 678 Middle Street here in Portsmouth with my wife, Allison, who's the only other member of the public here tonight, live. Um, and we have three children who are all in the Portsmouth public school system, and I want to take a little bit of your time to address some of our concerns about the student extracurricular alcohol policy. Uh, I know it's been a hot topic for a lot of you. Uh, you probably heard a lot about it over the recent last couple of months, if not probably a couple of years for those of you who have been here longer. Um, and, you know, first of all, I think we all recognize that in a perfect world, students wouldn't get alcohol. There wouldn't be alcohol parties. Maybe there wouldn't be alcohol at all. Uh, but there is. And I think we're going to be blind if we think that somehow we're going to stop students, all students, uh, from attending parties where there is alcohol or, frankly, some other illicit substances. Um, I also think that from w what we've experienced uh, in our community with the discussions that we've had amongst our friends who are also parents of other students in the Portsmouth Public High School system, uh, nobody likes the policy as is currently written. Maybe some people on the board feel differently, but so far, and everyone that I've spoken to, there's been unanimous support for some kind of change to this policy. And I think that in terms of, you know, what kind of changes that there ought to be, and I could go on and speak about half an hour for this policy because I unfortunately had an opportunity to review it at length recently. Uh, some of the things that I that noticed that really, really stuck out, and one of the ones that's the real thorn in the side for, I think, everyone in the community is that I, the notion that a student who is at a party is going to be punished for being in the presence of whatever that means. It might mean in the presence of knowingly, it might mean unknowingly, but in the presence of other students who are drinking alcohol. I have not spoken to any parents who would be upset with their children for being at a party where there's alcohol because they realize it's going to happen at some point during high school. We hope that our students and our children will make the right decisions and decide not to consume alcohol, decide to be a designated driver. When they make that decision, they should not be punished because they were found to be in the presence of other children who were making the wrong decisions. And everyone agrees that the drinking of alcohol is a wrong decision. There should be repercussions for that when they're caught. I also find that the, the students that are found in violation of the policy, there's this, this punishment schedule that's it's not 100% clear when you read it. But what it appears to do is it takes away a certain percentage of the extracurricular activity, and that's regardless of, of what the violation was. So if you have a situation where uh, currently as written, 
the policy stops or the policy punishes people if they're in the presence of alcohol in the exact same manner that they would punish the children who are drinking mm -hmm. alcohol, in the exact same manner as they would punish the students that are smoking marijuana, in the exact same manner that they would punish the students who are doing cocaine, in the exact same manner that they would punish the students who are shooting up heroin. Nobody <laughs> on this board can think that that's a rational way of approaching a policy to deter students and to proportionally exact some kind of punishment on the student for making bad decisions. You know, that's a whole vast array of different levels of an offense that should be treated in different ways. Um, Sorry, Joe, but your time is up. As expected. <laughs> Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Do we have any oh, members? I have a public comment. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Hi there, Elizabeth Barrett, One Freedom Circle, a member of the school board. Uh, I just want to take the three minutes to um, speak on concerns for policy, um, concerns for due process, uh, and, and just uh, and take the time to speak. Um, it's not clear to me uh, as far as the agenda tonight of whether the um, board can discuss um, issues that have come forward regarding uh, policy. Uh, IGD. Um, however, I see this as two issues. I see this as an IGD policy, and I also see this as a um, policy, or uh, should I say, um, preference of the board or uh, stance of the board of how we are going to deal with discipline and. Um, uh, extracurriculars uh, across the board. I know we, there's been mention of high school, middle school, elementary school. So I see this as two issues and I don't want one issue to be clouded by um, the IGD policy. Um, as it stands right now, we've obviously received a lot of emails uh, about the policy. I'd first ask the board to, or ask the school um, uh, that we implement some sort of policy to redact children's names from some of these uh, board emails. Um, it, there is a clear statement that says anything that you're saying is going to end up in the board packet, but I don't know if it's clear to parents that these packets are actually published online. So folks that are talking about their specific child, first name, last name, grade, um, are now going to have their child's name and incidents uh, published online. And so I'd ask the board to create a policy uh, or make a motion to, at some point, to uh, redact these uh, names, these children's names, because I do think we still have an obligation to protect these children um, given the circumstances. Um, One minute. <clears throat> I'd also say that um, um, it has been brought to our attention via an email that there is a, um, a Supreme Court decision by the New Hampshire Supreme Court. Uh, I believe it was back in the 80s, about NHIA sports and, and how that creates due process. The way I understand due process is, um, from my experience in law school, we studied uh, the Matthews case with administrative due process. Um, and so I think due process can be different for uh, different things depending on the circumstances. And obviously everybody doesn't have a legal background and I won't get into Matthews because it's like the worst case I studied in law school. So. Um, Needless to say, I think that we are, as we bring these extracurriculars into the school day and uh, provide time for them in the school day, we are kind of crossing a line in the gray area there. Um, uh, I'd also find it uh, challenging as the school board to comment on um, these policies. Uh, just to wrap it up, um, I, I think as a board, it's one of our things that we can create policy. So for it to solely reside in the policy committee is a little bit concerning to me, especially when I can't make it to the policy committee meetings. Um, and so I want to be able to provide my input as a board member. I think that's one of my duties um, if I can't make it to the policy committee. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Are there any other members of our live audience who wish to make public comment? Is there anybody in our Zoom? Do anyone in the Zoom audience who'd like to uh, join in public comment, please raise your uh, digital hand. Uh, seeing two to start, let's go with uh, Megan Scaretto. 
Go ahead, Megan. Hi there, Megan Serretto, 419 Marcy Street. And I am speaking tonight to request that a motion be put forward to look at code of conduct policy for the extracurriculars and co-curriculars. In particular, the clause in the presence of. This is, to repeat what others have said, is in no way condoning underage drinking or drug use. It is simply a request that this clause be reviewed and that those who hold the power in making any decisions in regard to this matter, please listen to all with an open mind. Is this clause even serving its purpose? That's the big question. It is my understanding that there are some that believe this clause has significant, significantly reduced underage drinking and drug use. This could not be further from the truth. Kids have just gotten better and smarter. Would anyone sign a four-year contract in which you are guilty for simply being there in violation or not? Students are not given a chance to defend themselves. Why always think the worst? Do you know each of the students' intentions? To take away sports and National Honor Society when a student has no chance to present their side of the story is wrong on many levels. As we know, our students have been through a lot over the course of the past two years. There has been much talk about mental health has anyone thought about the long lasting effects of a clause such as this? The impact this can have on our athletes and scholars. Asking students to sign a contract is one thing, but placing a punishment as the ones being handed out is far too severe. This clause is putting them in the position to choose between friends and sports. That is another loss for them and they have already lost so much. Punish those who are actually in violation of policy and not those that are perhaps present in a place or environment where it is. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, next up we have uh, Stephen Collins. Hi there, Stephen Collins, 230 Park Street in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, so I wrote a long-winded email. I hope you'll all get it. Everyone there will get a chance uh, to read it and digest it. I had some very serious concerns in there um, about really some of the sort of shrapnel that comes from uh, the honor code and, and the way that it's implemented and the lowest common denominator that uh, everybody's guilty till proven innocent, or I guess they don't even get a chance to, to prove innocence, they're just guilty. Um, and, and what I wanted to talk about tonight um, just quickly is sort of my own experience in a couple of different high schools. I went to a public high school in Massachusetts and then my family moved uh, to the middle of Maine and I went away to a, a private school during that time. In both cases, um, I might have found out a little bit about the disciplinary systems at each of them, but uh, I, you know, back then it was your parents in the school worked together to make sure you got through. And, and what I can tell you from every single person I've spoken with uh, and everyone certainly that we've heard from tonight and I've spoken with a lot of parents uh, in, the, in the Portsmouth system, both that were involved with the party on the Friday of vacation and that weren't. Uh, to every single person, uh, there's an adversarial relationship between our families and your school. We are not partners. It is you versus us. Uh, we, are, we are just a presumed guilty, and now we're into like Papa Bear mode where we're just trying to protect <laughs> kids um, so that, you know, they're not placed in harm's way. And, and how do we do that? How do we raise our kids so that they can go out and be social and have some life experiences and make choices that are good ones and, and be lauded for those good decisions and, um, you know, not just lock our kids away. Um, and so I just, I need everybody, everybody there to know that, um, the parents of this community, by and large, do not see the school as our ally uh, in sort of the, the co-managing of, of getting our kids through your school system and raised as proper adults. And um, I think we're missing a, a huge opportunity there. Uh, my parents absolutely saw the schools that I went to as, as their partners, 
and uh, that is not the case here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Next up, we have Kate Beelan. Go ahead, Kate. Oops, hold on. Hi there, uh, Kate Beeland, 373 Union Street. You all can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, sorry. It's hard from the phone. I should have come in person. <laughs> um, I just want to echo the two previous callers um, and really, I don't have anything prepared, but I just want to speak up again um, as I talk to many people. Um, and they share the same sentiments as the people that have spoken up and people who have sent letters. Um, you know, I certainly understand a zero uh, tolerance policy um, for people who have made the choice to put themselves in that position, okay? Um, but I, I do request again that we, we look at, you, you know, it's easy to just to say this is what it is zero tolerance, you're there, you're guilty, that's it. It's actually harder to dig deeper and be progressive. It takes work, just like it's taken work, certainly in all the circumstances, other than what we're talking about now, just these past two years as a, as a school system, as teachers, as kids, as parents. Um, so I just re I, I request that we all dig deep and, and try harder to be progressive like we are with other social issues. I see this as a social issue. Um, again, I understand the zero uh, tolerance policy, but I think we can do better in regards to what our object, what we're trying to achieve um, for anyone who might be present, or even maybe we can do better on that zero tolerance policy. Um, it, it, it's not just a kind of slap on the wrist, you miss a couple of games, you really can change the trajectory of someone's future. Um, and I'm not sure that's a good thing. I, th I think we can do better. I don't know what the solution is, but I just ask we be open, and that's it. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. One second. I'm trying to get Carrie here. Carrie <clears throat> Nolte has her hand up. I'm here. Go ahead and talk while I mess with your video, Carrie. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, uh, Carrie Nolte uh, at 321 Bannett Street. I am a board member who is exposed to COVID at home, but I did want to speak um, during public comment um, really on, on what we've already heard as far as these components not being, these policies not being supportive. Um, although my role on the board is to, um, is to hear all of the sides and the history and the policy and the admin, um, you know, in my professional role, my research is around substance use. Um, and, you know, most people who struggle with addiction later in life start at 13, 14, and early intervention is really important. And so creating an environment where even those that are using substances are fearful of disclosing and seeking the help that they need um, is concerning to me. Um, and within this this policy, you know, I think that it's a it's a good um, it's a good thing for a student to want to help a friend to be a designated driver to get them home from a party if they have made choices in drinking. So, I just really want the um, as this policy gets discussed further to really look at the evidence. Um, although there, I have heard perceptions that this policy reduces drinking. Um, that isn't based in, in literature, that isn't in peer reviewed journals, that isn't historically what happens. Um, and so if we do adopt a different policy, making sure um, that there is evidence that these are effective prevention strategies and that going forward, what we're doing is the best for all of the students and families in our district to both get support they need and to accomplish their goals. Um, you know, I think that missing a few games um, from athletics can be a difference in a scholarship um, and a full ride and all sorts of things. And those are real consequences that extend long into the future. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, anyone else for public comment? hands up nope. no one else so I'm going to close public comment <clears throat> and I I would just say I um, as a board member I greatly appreciate the outpouring of feedback from 
um, the public. And I think we have an obligation to teach our students. And that doesn't just mean an accumulation of facts. That means teach them to be functioning adults in the world and to create a climate and culture that is supportive and that is able to um, evolve with the current landscape. And I think the recent incidences and the concerns raised by parents makes me realize that this board needs to take a deep consideration into our discipline policies and practices in our school district and see if those are aligning with our district goals. That would be my hope going forward. Um, excuse me, Margo. Just while we have people on the line, can we just let people know that the policy meeting is public tomorrow and it, the policy meeting will be from 9.30 to 10.30 here at City Hall and this policy will be discussed um, and board members will also be present, but there is a time for public comment then. So I just wanted to let people know that before they drop off the line. Yep. And that meeting, just so folks know, that meeting has a one hour time frame reserved in the school board conference room. Um, there are no special presentations tonight, so we can move on to the superintendent's report. Sure. So uh, in your packet, you have uh, the April edition of the board administrator, uh, as well as the email correspondence you received as of the printing of this packet. Uh, and you have the draft for school board meeting dates for the 22-23 school year. This mirrors what you've traditionally done in terms of the frequency, the days, and the locations even of your board meetings. Uh, it does contemplate uh, going back to having meetings uh, at school, so we can certainly, it's not something you have to vote on, uh, certainly can be adjusted as you go. Uh, you have the policy committee minutes from the March 11th policy uh, meeting, and as, as Hope just said, I did want to give an update that the policy committee will be taking a deep dive, beginning a deep dive into the policy IGD, um, and, uh, and I think um, really doing some due diligence in terms of um, making some possible thoughtful reflections around what might, um, what might respond to some of the feedback that you've received. Um, so just to preview tomorrow's meeting a little bit, we will go into a little bit of the history of how this policy has evolved over the years. Uh, and uh, probably talk about a process to go forward in revision that would include input from parents, input from students, input from coaches, um, and so that we can um, make the most thoughtful process and, and re uh, revision to the policy to bring back to you. And so even if you're not on the policy committee, of course, every policy will come to you. And this one will be substantive, of course, enough to come to you for two readings. So you'll have two chances as a full board to discuss and debate and determine uh, any changes to that. Uh, you also have the, uh, um, the FY23 budget book um, that went out in the newsletter last Friday. Uh, we were hoping to have hard copies for you here today, but we don't, but we'll get those for your next meeting. Uh, but essentially, as you know, this is a book we publish every year to try to highlight some of the work that goes on in the district, as well as give some thoughtful narrative to the budget proposal uh, that we would be bringing forward uh, to the city council, which again is a process that has started and will continue into May with our presentation and discussion with the city council. Uh, you have a memo for uh, the update on overnight field trips that are coming up. Uh, and I just wanted to give a quick update for the administrative searches. The principal search committee met again today to continue interviews. Uh, we meet again tomorrow to hopefully determine finalists to move forward in the PHS principal search. Uh, and that process will again turn into a much more public process with uh, four parent forums opportunities for people to uh, meet and greet with the finalists. And um, again, on a timeline to bring forward to you in May, hopefully for your first meeting in May at nomination for PHS principal. Um, the uh, program director position for the Lister Academy program is a couple weeks behind the principal search. We will be meeting with the search committee uh, for that group tomorrow, uh, which does include students and parents. And uh, that process will likely lead into first round interviews right after April vacation. So um, I guess I would pause there for any, and, and you have a correspondence, a letter of resignation is the last thing that's to note. Okay, Liz. Uh, just a few things that you've gone through. Um, first off, as far as calendar updates, I know we have November 8th on there. That's election night. I'd ask that maybe we switch that around. 
They may have Valentine's Day on there. I'm oh. very single, but uh, I'd like to value family a little bit. So if we could do February 7th or the 21st, it looks like those days are spaced out enough that we can change that around. Um, as far as the overnight field trips, I was curious if, um, you know, what the school or maybe something that we could send a policy regarding, um, uh, you know, a two-person a two system. I know a lot of organizations that have struggled with um, overnight stuff as far as um, adults and children dealing with each other in overnight situations have created a um, two-adult to uh, system per child sort of thing. And I just want to be sure that we are being proactive as far as, um, you know, protecting children from um, uh, sexual assault and any other uh, thing. Obviously, you know, I think our um, staff are great, but at the same time, I, I just want to be sure that we have some sort of policy, and I'm not sure that, I don't know if we have a policy in place or if that's something you can speak on as far as the overnight stuff. Um, regarding the policy committee meeting minutes, um, there was a discussion at the policy committee meeting, which I have not been able to take part in because of my work schedule, um, even though I was appointed to the committee. Uh, but there was a discussion about how to amend or edit drafts of policies that have been sent to the school board. Um, our attorney explained that the committee sends suggested drafts to the entire school board for their consideration and discussion. If there are suggested amendments, the board is free to do this at second reading or in the case of a single read only at the first reading. Uh, she said that sending them back to the policy committee unnecessarily prolongs the adoption or reapproval process of the board uh, or when the board can make the amendments. However, um, it was also explained that typographical errors or any sort of error shouldn't be taking up board time. So I think essentially when you're looking at, you know, you we're dealing with a sentence right now of, you know, in the, in the um, we talk about IGD, you had also mentioned that as well. We're talking about a sentence of in the presence of alcohol and drugs, but the way I read that as an attorney, or I think, you know, what the intention was or the interpretation was actually to include the whole sentence. So, I mean, there's gr grammatical errors and, uh, or, you know, it could have been better interpreted or conveyed essentially um, by maybe a few commas or so. So I guess I'm a little concerned with how to convey these things to the policy committee. If I can't be on policy, I had requested Word documents so that I can edit in line. Um, these things are supposed to go to Paulette. At the same time, I mean, I think it's a little redundant for me to type out a whole email transcribing the policy and then saying, put a comma here, put a period here, so we actually have a definition. So, I mean, I can convert every policy from a PDF to a Word document with my Adobe tools, but I don't think that that's realistic. And I think as the board, it's sort of our duty to overlook these policies, regardless of whether they end up in committee or not. And I guess I'm just a little concerned that maybe we need to address um, how these, you know, how we are able to effectuate change as a board versus um, what ends up in policy committee, given that you know, one of our three duties, I think, is to, you know, the only thing that we can do as a board is create policy. So um, I don't want to dictate my duty as a board member to the policy committee when I should be able to amend or do things. And I don't also, also I don't want to waste board time. I also don't want to be sending stuff back to committee, back to committee, back to committee. Um, so I think we could be a little more efficient there. And I guess I'm just trying to understand maybe how best to do it, and I understand the role of policy, but um, uh, it seems a bit convoluted, especially when we're getting into this meeting tomorrow of adding public comment and sort of going through all of this. It just seems a little bit unnecessary, and maybe the bigger question is, you know, how do we deal with this as a board? So, so it sounds like, Liz, the question that you're asking that we take into consideration is how do we best give feedback regarding policies to be taken to the policy committee and does it sounds like you're also requesting that when policies are up for consideration prior to going that comments can be made that, that board members can be made aware of that policy prior to it going so that feedback can be given to the policy committee members so that that can be represented in the policy committee meeting did i summarize that 
Yeah, but I guess I, I don't, yeah. if it's my duty as a school board member and my role as a school board member and one of the things I'm able to do to effectuate change is to create policy or help um, do policy, I don't want to uh, feed my, pro my, my policy recommendations through another board member, through the committee. I want to be able to, you know, I think the purpose of a first reading or second reading is to point out where there are issues. And if it does go back to committee, um, you know, I guess, I understand the concept of a committee and being able to discuss it. I think, you know, I had made some recommendations on record um, uh, of, a, of a policy that's up for uh, consideration tonight, and, 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 my, and it still is not reading right to me. And, and I guess I'm just a little concerned that maybe it's less a, um, less a substantive issue and more a, 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 a procedural issue in, in how we're sort of dealing with these things and how they get translated. and you know, who does what. I mean, I don't want to flip the the board upside down as far as how we're dealing with policies and having a committee. I think a committee is a perfect way to do it. I guess I'm just a little concerned that with how each of our, you know, especially with this upcoming policy with IGD, how are we each able to provide our own influence on the policy um, short of striking it down every time and sending it back to committee? Um, I hear the question. Hope, did you have a response? I, I, I did want to just add to what Elizabeth is saying, because I do feel like there is a lot of procedural um, issues with how we handle policy right now. Um, and, and they, to me, as a, they deter getting feedback from board members. Um, and I'm not saying that's an intentional deterrent, but it makes it very difficult, as Elizabeth has said, is if you can send your comments to the policy committee, but quite frankly, sometimes our policies need to be very reworked. Um, and so not having a template where those changes can be made is very difficult to go into a policy committee and say, okay, in the second paragraph on line five or this in versus we live in a day and age where you we have all kinds of documents that you can add comments, right? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that we need to kind of bring our policy committee up to the 21st century and how we, transfer information. Um, I also feel that there is a long lag sometimes in policies of going from the first reading and waiting for the policy committee me meetings to occur. This is a perfect example is our meeting is tomorrow, but our board meeting is tonight. So then we have to would potentially either put another meeting on the docket or wait till May. And that doesn't seem like due process sometimes with some policies that are just quick reads that Steve brings forth, right? Like they're state changes, federal changes, sure. But when a policy impacts our school district, I think those policies need to be treated with a little more expediency and care. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would like to have the policy committee maybe explore of do they need to add an extra meeting when those types of things come up so that they align with board meeting discussions. Yeah. Um, and, and then I just wanted to, to add um, in regards to this particular policy meeting, I, I've requested could it be recorded, especially for board members that would like to hear but can't attend. I feel like if we're asked to vote on a policy and, and the third party conversation is happening and all the board members aren't allowed to be part of that conversation, then we should be privy to that information or privy to that information, um, especially if, as Elizabeth said, like our duty is policy and I don't feel it's right to ask someone to vote on something when they haven't heard the full discussion. Um, so if that's a possibility for tomorrow's meeting, I think that could be additionally helpful. Can confirm that? Yeah, I'll confirm with that. Attorney Dwyer. I don't see if there's, unless there's a rule, some legal reason she would offer why um, you could do that. Yeah, it's, it's, okay. okay. Thank you, Hope. I think that those are, and Liz, I think those are great suggestions. I know that we, Lisa had a question and then Nancy has a question. I just want to echo what Hope and Elizabeth have said. I do think with all of the various technology we have to edit documents and keep track of people's comments that we should be able to find a way to do that better with policy. And I would definitely love to see the policy committee take a look at what they think the best way to do that would be in terms of their workflow. And just also as a clarification from part of the superintendent's report. It would be my understanding that if we were going to make any decisions about visiting a policy outside of the policy committee or a full board meeting, that that would have to be a decision made by the full board, correct? That's correct. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. 
Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Nancy, and then Brian. Um, hello, everyone. I'm sorry I'm not there, but unfortunately, I tested positive for COVID. Um, I feel pretty good, but obviously, I couldn't be there in person. Um, I think what I would like to say about this is, you know, we have a process, we have a procedure that's been in, in there for many, many years. We're the school board. We can change whatever we want. So if we want, the, the way it works now is the policy committee studies the policy, brings it back to the board. The board can make whatever changes it deems fit. In that case, it usually goes back to the policy committee for another, you know, a revision or the way it's written or, or whatever, and then it comes back to the school board. The school board is always the final decision. I think you all know that. Um, so that's the way it's been. That's the way it's worked in the past. Obviously, we want to change it so you can all do edits to it before it goes to the policy committee. I guess we could do that, but what if, you know, we have two members now on the policy committee, Pip and Mago. What if they get seven different edits for every policy committee they go to based on seven other board members. I don't know how manageable that would be. Um, that would make a very long policy committee meeting where they have to go through all those edits <clears throat> and make changes. So I think we can certainly examine it, but we have to look at it realistically too. Um, like you say, a lot of the policies are just a stamp of approval, um, but um, some of them aren't and some of them require a lot of time and attention. So. You know, the fact that the policy committee looks at them first, brings it back to the school board. The school board has the final decision. If you want to make revisions at that point, you can. It goes back to the policy committee, comes back to the school board. I, don't, I mean, we can certainly look at it, but I don't know how realistic it is, especially if you get seven different edits from seven different board members. So um, that's what I would like to say. Thanks, Nancy. Brian, did you still? Well, I had a, a comment on something else, but I will say I'll, I'll echo Liz and, and um, Hope. Um, I, I think we should come up, you know, yes, we do run the risk of having a lot of edits, but I think, um, you know, especially when there's a, certainly a, an issue like this, we should, you know, have that ability if we need to do that. Um, the question I did have was on the, the field trips, um, to say two overnight, but I see I'm counting a lot. Is it just is it just a typo? Yeah, it is, okay. Brian. I'm sorry. Right. So, so this is a, a memo that we add to as we get requests in, and the number two was not updated. And, and the other question I've asked this before: Is there any way to collect um, information about the costs of these trips? Because again, looking in the lens of equity and how much they're accessing funds, you know, um, the funds that we have available. Um, those kinds of things would be good to know and yeah we absolutely can I, I think that could be a whole discussion in and of itself yeah. um, based on all things that cost extra for kids okay. um, rather than just random trip by trip but I, sure. yeah I think yeah. that would be an important discussion yeah I, th I agree with that across the board would be great but yeah thanks oh, um, sorry I just had one more quick follow-up at some point in time, I recall a couple of policies coming forth before the board and the changes were highlighted in red. I would really appreciate if somehow we could make indications of what we're seeing from the change to what was the original of the document um, without having to kind of teeter back and forth. And so I, I'm not saying that every policy has to be looked at first on um, with changes, but I do, I would like to look at one more thing to add to George's plate of just from a technological standpoint how are we housing our policies and like I said how can we make those be a little more um, 21st century right yeah I, I'm being a member on the policy committee I think these are great ideas and I think um, anytime you can get more feedback going into the initial discussion it's a deeper more thoughtful more intentional discussion on the policy so that time isn't wasted on the semantics of a period or a colon. And, and I think the point you raise, Hope, on certain policies, the um, time sensitivity is, is important for us to be responsive. And so I, I think here's one of those scenarios where process is slowing a conversation down by the nature of which it was. And so I think it's a great question to ask on how do we 
how do we, yeah, modernize the process so that all voices are heard and we arrive at the best policy to represent the intention of the, of the policy? I, I don't know if it adds more work to the policy committee, but I just wonder, um, is it possible when it's placed on our agenda, because I know you send out the agenda so that we can look at the policies before review of the board meetings, is it possible to indicate why the changes are being made? Like, what's the motivation behind it? Because I know you present that information, Steve, at the board meeting, but it would be helpful, at least to me, I know when I'm reading it, if it's like, hey, this is just a simple state change, this is required by federal law for a change, or this came up because of X, we just have context around why this policy is on the docket, and. And I don't know if we can sometimes limit how many we're reviewing. Sometimes it seems like there's a load of them. And certainly, again, I would defer to you guys because I'm sure you're trying to scoop up things and categories, and that's probably, with as many as you have to go through, a difficult process to limit. But Yeah, and, and we uh, obviously, in the policy committee minutes, the intent is to try to capture the conversation that would lead to any change. But what I, what unfortunately, what happens sometimes is those minutes are not lined up with the policies in the days you're looking at. Them. Right. So we can do a, a, a better mm -hmm. job of aligning the minutes right next to the policies that okay. you're talking or about. Okay. Or even if we could have yeah. a notation of which minutes to look yeah. at or yeah. something that to indicate what's driving the policy change. Right. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to echo a little bit what Margo said. Um, I, too, am on the policy committee, and I think that um, before I was on the policy committee, I found it very hard to have the kind of input that I wanted to, um, and I, I brought that up at the last policy meeting a little bit, too, um, regarding the procedures. I completely agree the procedure needs an update, and I think ultimately that some of the things we're talking about will make the process much more efficient. Um, I. I think getting input from seven or more members um, could feel like a lot, but I think it will still be more efficient than going back and forth several times to different meetings and stretching out over months. Um, so I think I'd like to suggest that maybe we as a policy committee work on, on this topic and try to come back to the board next at our next meeting or our first meeting in May um, with an updated procedure that we can at least test out and if it proves to be harder or, or there are problems then we can tweak it but um, I do think it seems like it really is time for an update. Love that idea. Noted. Love it. Should should we have the policy committee come up with that new procedure or who should come up with yes, that Yes, that's procedure? what she was saying, Nancy. She was saying that the policy committee would come up with something to propose to the board okay. for okay. the May meeting. Anne? I, I just wanted to comment that usually Kathleen Dwyer, our, our city attorney for, for us, has usually explained why something needs to happen. The other thing is sometimes the wording is awkward, and we had wondered why we needed to keep that wording as awkward, and she had said that legally it has to be that way at times. So th there is a reason, even though it might not make much sense to us. Liz. Uh, just to follow up, um, what Ann mentioned is correct. I think there is uh, certain things that we need to run by our attorney and understand what our attorney comes from uh, as far as giving us a certain direction. My understanding is that they, the attorney and Paulette want to hold on to the Word document version of, um, of a policy because that's the, you know, just so that they have one working document in front of them so there's not any confusion as to what documents what are and whatnot. I understand that, but I think given how technology has updated, um, there is a better way for us to sort of collaborate or to sort of integrate there. Um, and I guess another piece of this, though, is to address the immediate concerns of the um, the IGD policy, and I understand there's a policy committee meeting tomorrow. I am a bit concerned that the policy committee meeting is for an hour, and we're opening it up to public comments, so then how are we supposed to have any sort of meaningful discussion about it? And I don't know that we can actually get, you know, I don't, first off, I don't know that we can get meaningful discussion in an hour. And second off, I think there needs to be some directives by the board as far as how are we understanding what the policy should be. Um, whether it should be um, like what Carrie said, you know, there's no journal out there that says 
punitive measures or, or, or whatnot deter substance use. So I think there needs to be, you know, I don't know if Steve can speak to this at all, but I think there needs to be some sort of understanding or directive of how we are guiding our disciplinary policies. What are we, what are we pulling that information from? And I think that is a board decision to understand what we want to use to direct how we're developing a policy. We could take all the recommendations from the policy committee, but I don't know that the policy committee is equipped. I'm not equipped to understand, you know, what our issues are, what are we looking to deter, and what is the best practice for deterring those things. And so um, I would like that the board, you know, I would make a motion to um, create some sort of committee or some sort of, um, uh, not committee, I don't think we need a separate committee. I think we need to schedule a meeting as the board to discuss um, what maybe our next steps are or put this as an agenda item sooner than later about where we're gonna be pulling this information from to guide um, disciplinary policies. And I don't know that that's something that the policy committee should be doing. I think it's something that we need to do as a board to guide um, what direction we're going in and where we're getting our information from to guide these policies. So, okay. um, yep, great. Lisa, we're going to make motions under new business later, though, correct? Um, still on superintendent's report here? Right, but we can make a motion under a superintendent's report or no? Uh, you could make a motion um, whenever you'd like. I guess right. just to, to sort of, again, bring out the, the process points a little bit here. Um, so again, separating out the general work from the policy committee from what the issues are raised on this particular policy, uh, IGD, um, I think, you know, to Hope's point, you know, we, we don't want to delay the conversation, but we also want to make sure it's a thorough, well thought out, well informed conversation. And so I know in talking with Nancy, I didn't know if she wanted to jump on. Part of, part of the history with this policy is indeed getting a, a, a multi-stakeholder group together to talk about a thoughtful approach to what might or might not need to be changed. And you know, we'll talk again tomorrow morning about it in policy committee, but this version of the policy you see here actually does involve a lot more restorative elements than its previous version did. Um, and I think the conversation could very well be, is that enough? I mean, do we want to go back to say, what else could we be doing that would be more restorative uh, in nature um, around this policy? And that, um, that I think would be an important conversation. Um, but, I, you know, again, I, I don't want to, to also create the illusion that this is a policy that's going to change next week. I mean, this is something that we do have to take our time and dive into and involve a lot of people. So. Um, so I think that's what we'll be talking about tomorrow. So I have a motion that I would like to make at this time, if that's okay, and then we can discuss it. Um, I would like to move to schedule a school board work session in April to discuss our K-12 approach to discipline and behavior support that comes from guidance, um, and then invite representatives from guidance and administration who handle discipline and behavior to attend so that we can hear from them as a first step you know, how things are working. Second. Do we have questions? Yes, chance for discussion okay. of the motion. Yes, yeah. so the discussion of the motion, I just want to make sure I understand you correctly, that um, are you saying that we would also be discussing what comes out of the policy committee? That's not in place of tomorrow's policy committee. You're saying that we would still be discussing the outcome of tomorrow's policy committee, as well as what you just like laid I'm out? Not clear that there would be an outcome from tomorrow's policy committee meeting. I don't believe anybody from guidance is in attendance. I don't mean a resolve, oh. but if they're having a conversation, there would be a summary of the conversation sure. and they might have a recommendation or anything else. So I, I, what I'm under, trying to understand is, are you saying that you want a separate meeting in place of the policy committee meeting or in addition to the policy committee's work? And then we would be discussing the policy committee's work as well as your, the disciplinary. Okay. Approaches. And I suppose it would be in addition to the policy committee involving the full board and whoever we would invite from administration and guidance who can speak K-12 to how they see the discipline policy as it stands being implemented. Because I don't think it makes sense to start changing policy until we have a better understanding of how people are using the policy that we have in place right now, if that makes sense. 
that makes sense. Thank that you. makes sense. And Pip, you were a second? Yes. Uh, and you have a discussion point on it. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> um, I, I think that this is an excellent example of a policy that does have a, a significant impact directly on our students and on our com whole community for that matter. Um, and so I really am in favor of involving all our entire board in the discussions of it. I don't think that needs to replace the committee meeting, the policy committee meeting. Um, but I don't expect that we're going to be able to make any significant decisions tomorrow in an hour, especially with public comment. Um, so I would, I would really advocate that we could all get together and work specifically on this, um, on this policy, or actually, as um, Lisa proposed, on our overall approach to discipline K through 12, uh, so we understand that and then can relate or can use that um, sort of global perspective to, to address. The specific policy that's been brought up today. Yeah. Yep. Um, no. Considering that uh, this is going to be directly affecting students, uh, I would like to request that, if not necessarily me, some student representation also be uh, directly invited to the meeting. I'm not exactly sure how public you would plan to make it, but <coughs> regardless, I think the door should be open. It for is that. a public meeting, Nick, and so if students are free at 9.30 tomorrow, <coughs> there is a Zoom link, and they are welcome and encouraged to attend that, and then the motion on the floor about the work session would also be a public work session with the full board present. Um, it wouldn't would fall under a non-public, so <coughs> both are opportunities for student voices to be heard. And, and I would um, I would agree with Pip, what, exactly what Pip has said on this, and I think um, I think it's a great lens by which to drive the conversation forward. Is to start with where are we at, and then come. I think I think it, policy, as one of our speakers said in our public comment, is one of the true lanes of a school board, and we have full ownership over policy. And so I think the entire board needs to be part of the discussion on. Um, the mentality behind it, the intention of it, whether it's best servicing the folks that it's meant to service. So I would be in favor of a, of a committee of, of, of it being an entire board conversation. Did you so, see Nancy had her hand oh, up? Oh, Nancy, sorry, and then Liz. Yes, that was, um, I was going to say this under um, future agenda items, but I would like us to agree now on a night next week that we could have a, originally I was going to say a board meeting, but after a conversation I had today with Lisa and Hope, it seemed like it would serve us better if we had a work session. Now, the only question I have a Steve is, can the public comment in a work session? Uh, that is up to you. Yep. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. Okay, so we can have the public comment then. All right, I think we should have, I would like to propose, well, we're on one motion now, so we can only do one motion at a time. But that we have a, um, we pick a night that people are available next week. I know the city council has a meeting on Monday, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a meeting on Monday. Correct, Steve? Uh, that's correct. We just can't be in here. Okay. Okay. All right. So we could have a meeting on, on whatever night we want next week. I think it should be a work session. I think we should invite stakeholders. If you want to talk about who those stakeholders should be now, we could do that. Or if you want to email them to me and Margo, we can put together a list of who the stakeholders should be. Um, and we'll invite them to come and talk and, and get their opinions about what the best move, movement forward is. Um, it's worked effectively in the past because I think stakeholders felt like their opinions were valued and listened to by the board so i certainly encourage us to do this if everybody agrees um so if if people well let's vote on one let's vote on lisa's motion first which is basically you know the same liz, thing but then we have to pick a date okay so nancy before we vote liz had her hand up and then we'll see okay. we'll have to take a vote yep. on lisa's motion and then i hear that we would need a second motion we for a proposed date yeah yeah. Um, I just want to um, be mindful of time and what might this might take as far as stakeholders and time. And so I guess my only uh, request would be your friendly amendment, if, if, if I could figure out how to exactly say it, would be something to the effect of, you know, I think at the next meeting it would be great to have every stakeholder there so that the board can create a policy, I mean, excuse me, create a philosophy around how they want to deal. Um, with discipline um, in, in taking a, a you know in adopting um, just a philosophy of a therapeutic approach versus a 
punitive approach or restorative approach uh, instead of a punitive approach. I guess my only other concern, though, is that I don't want this to be, I don't want this, I wouldn't want to see this um, work session turn into a situation where we're hearing from everybody, but we're not really doing, able to take action. I, I would really like to hear from, you know, high school individually, middle school individually, elementary school individually, and I think most importantly, given that we're dealing with this IGD policy and the impl implications that have have been triggered as far as um, students missing things and, and everything that's gone on. I think that's sort of a priority, I would think, um, at this point. And so I would really like to hear from um, uh, the principal and admin how these po how this policy in particular, as well as similar policies, play out. You know, how do the facts come in? How do what is the procedure? How does this look that's like? Cool. You know, mock you know, mock situation, what does it look like? And I think that might be a separate conversation from everybody get in the room, let's all agree to have a philosophy one way or the other. Um, and so I just want to be very um, thoughtful about how we're going about it and be sure that we're actually able to effectuate change essentially or understand. Um, so I would propose a friendly amendment um, to, to this. You vote Could first I just and interrupt for a second? Vote. Yeah, I guess I'm just so, I, I don't understand. You're requesting or will be presenting at the policy meeting tomorrow specific to the high school, which it sounds like is the part that. You yeah, but I guess I'd like to amendment. hear that to the whole board and not just the policy committee. Um, I'd like to understand from the whole board perspective because I'm not going to be able to make the meeting right, tomorrow. Right. Which, which is, is why, why I asked for it to be recorded. recorded. And I, I, I But do that doesn't provide me a, a ability to ask questions, and I think that's what I need to be able to do to, un to fully understand how this, how this truly plays out. I don't know that even uh, principal is going to have uh, time tomorrow given public comment and everything that needs to get done to really thoroughly understand. And not only is it the principal, but, you know, how does this, you know, what is the, who are all the stakeholders at the high school? You know, I would assume it would be athletic director, principal, assistant principals, guidance counselors. So I think that's a substantial group of people. So I don't know if I want that substantial group of people with middle school's substantial group of people, with every elementary school's substantial group of people, and then all get in here and hear from everybody, you know, and have some sort of coming to philosophy about, I guess I, I think I would suggest, and I, it, as we move forward, maybe parsing this out a little bit um, and, and doing it that way. So. Okay, so that, Hope, did you have your hand up or not? I, yes. I, I just wanted to clarify, because I know I had originally requested that it be added to okay. tonight's Thank agenda. You. It wasn't asked for another meeting. And so um, I, I think it's not necessarily an either or. It can be an and both situation where we allow the policy community to have the conversation. We record the information. I understand some people may not be able to be available, but then we could I would ask that we would have a summary of that conversation put together and sent out to the board so we have that information. So then it, for this motion to be passed, we don't need to set the logistics and the agenda for the motion. And so I think, you know, if, if Liz or any other board member feels that they did not receive everything they need, then they can certainly ask for that information to be added to the workshop agenda. Um, so I just wanted to point out that we don't need to figure out in tonight's session, the logistics of the agenda to have a separate meeting. Okay, so let's start with Lisa. If you could please reread the motion. Let's try to reach. Sorry, it's okay. I have one set of glasses that works on my computer and one that works here, and it's pretty embarrassing and awesome. Bear with me. <laughs> All right. Um, I move to schedule a school board work session in April to discuss our K-12 approach to discipline and behavior support that includes representatives from guidance and administration at each school level, elementary, middle, and high school. And we had a second. That was Pip. All those in favor of this motion. Do we all have to, do we have to do a roll call vote on this one? We do need to do a roll down. call vote. <clears throat> um, does that say you've, you, no, uh, go ahead. Uh, Liz Barrett? How, can I just be, just to clarify how we go about amending this? We vote on it and then offer an amendment? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, aye. Pip Clues? Yes. Lisa Rappaport? Yes. Ann Walker? Yes. Margot Peabody? Yes. Nancy Clayberg? 
Yes. Hope Van Epps? Yes. Brian French? Yes. Carrie Nolte? Yes. <clears throat> do I also have a motion to choose a date? Do we need a motion for the date, or do we need to <laughs> so, so I don't know if we need to, to we just need consensus on the date, okay, I think. Consensus. But, um, but I, I would also just point out, if I could, that next week is, um, if we're looking at a span of organizing within a week, and you're looking for administration and guidance from every level. That is kind of a rushed, you know, timeline to, to get staff necessarily in. Not to say it can't be done. I just wouldn't have the expectation that we'll have everybody there. Right. We, there's also the just say on Tuesday night was the tentative tentative date we put out for a uh, PHS principal forum. Right. I was far, so. So. I would love to suggest that, oh, sorry, Anne, go ahead. I was just going to suggest that in, in view of, of what's happening now, that maybe it should start with the high school issue and then proceed on afterwards to the middle school and elementary. Okay. Because that, that whole thing all together would be large. Carrie, yeah. Carrie also has her hand up. Oh, yep, Carrie. Carrie. I just wanted to propose one addition that, um, as I assume is gonna come up in the policy committee meeting that we reach out and um, invite uh, a representative from the, uh, what is it, NI, NHIAA, the life of, the, of an athlete program, because I think that some of those recommendations are misinterpreted in, in their guidance. Okay. Okay, I noted that. Nancy. You had your hand up as well? Uh, well, I was just going to propose uh, Wednesday Wednesday or Thursday night. I think Wednesday. Wednesday. Oh, never mind. Uh, Thursday is looking solid. Nick has got a big nod. Brian, good. <laughs> Thursday 21st. Thursday the 21st. There's a Don Darrow PTA meeting that night with the right. principal. Don Darrow principal with the PTA meeting, but I don't know if that makes a difference. Okay. What time is that? Do you know? Uh, Six thirty, probably till eight. Well, I, um, so then the the discussion that needs to ensue is both the suggestion that Liz and Ann made is: Do we feel as though this work session needs to be divided out by grade level or um, divisional levels right. for the discussion? <laughs> that's, that's, there have been two proposals, so I'll go around I think we start to, no we'll go around the side Liz um, so yeah so I would do it a motion to amend my only um, uh, motion to amend to focus on the high school to start um, because I think the high school would be the best prepared because they've already sort of been thinking about this and you know they're essentially coming tomorrow <laughs> my only concern though and I don't know if Steve can answer this question because I think it's more of a legal question is that I think what I, we're trying to drill down to some extent is staffing uh, staff's interpret, you know, a staff or admin's interpretation of how they're applying things, and I don't know if we're getting into staffing issues of that that may need to be non-public as far as the situation that just occurred, discussing how it played out. If you know, maybe we can have some specifics. I don't know, you know. So I guess my only concern would be in having a public session. Um, would be is if we're really truly trying to understand this and how it plays out logistically, we'd actually be discussing real hypotheticals of kids' situations and, you know, that there may be some protected information there. So I say that with some sort of understanding that obviously we do want public input at the same time. I do wonder if there's a component of this that needs to be non-public in order to have uh, real conversations with admin about how these things play out, real conversations to Steve about how these things are implemented, um, and, you know, uh, how these, how, how the policies that we're effectuating are actually playing out in practice. Um, and I don't know that, I, you know, I, I don't know if that would, if it qualifies as non-public, if we could qualify it as a non-public because of um, uh, um, not staffing, but um, uh, I don't know if Steve understands what I'm getting at here, but. Um. Yeah, so I, I guess I would point out um, it, it wouldn't be appropriate for this board to dive into any specific disciplinary situation um, that administration is dealing with. Uh, I think the conversation would be public and it would be along these lines of what 
philosophical stance are we taking? What kind of intervention measures do we have in place? Just some of the, the so the, there's a broader understanding of the process and the intent, I think, is what I'm hearing. Um, because I think your point is well taken, which is that there is a board role in this, and then there's how administration is working through decisions um, guided by those policies, and it wouldn't be the board's role to go into those decisions necessarily as much as it would be to inform right. the policy. Right. But I guess I say that because we have this sentence that's um, up for various interpretations. We've had a lot of parents say it's in the presence of alcohol. I would read it as as having the end of the sentence, which is in the presence of essentially a kid that's violating the statute. And I don't know if that's what we were trying to get at initially or, or where we're going at. So I think that we have to have that sort of discussion. And I don't know if that invokes any sort of um, uh, you know, if, if Mary Lyons is saying she interprets this way, you interpret this way, another person interprets it this way, I don't know if we're getting into staffing issues or, you know, in sort of understanding how we're doing it, because if they did make a misstep, it could open us up to legal liability in some of these situations is my concern. Personally, I appreciate the concern. I feel as though that right in what you're saying would highlight that there's a lack of clearness and the need to reach clearness on intention and direction going forward which would be the purpose of a work session is start with where we're at and see where the disconnects are and then as a board decide what is that overarching thing by which to filter the policies through it's a work it'll it'll it's a work session it's not gonna i don't think a conclusion will come but i think um I think it would highlight that. Pip, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's a distinction that needs to be made here, which is um, <clears throat> that there's one specific policy that we all seem to agree needs to be addressed, and then there's our philosophy, which Steve just spoke to. And I'm concerned that if we get into one conversation, we're not going to have time for the other. So I just wonder if we want to specify exactly what part of that we're going to try to address in this work session because it seems like we might bounce back and forth a lot and that won't be quite as productive as if we choose one or the other. Yep. Totally agree. Lisa? I'm yeah, I just want to clarify from my standpoint and I'm certainly open to if other people want to take a different approach with the meeting but from my perspective I think we do have a need K-12 to sort of have a better understanding of how we're raising our kids up through the district so that they learn you know, early in elementary school, what behavior expectations we have for them, what their consequences should be. And if we're teaching them, you know, in fourth grade on the playground to be an upstander, if you see something wrong and go tell an adult and that you will be praised for that action, then it seems like there's a disconnect somewhere along the way. If we reach the high school and when they come to be a designated driver or help somebody leave a situation, they're still in the presence of a policy violation or alcohol and so there may be some disciplinary implications for that so I guess I agree with Pip I can't unpack all of this in a few hours with a couple of people these are big questions but I guess my ultimate goal here is to have an understanding of from the ground up how are we training our kids to behave in ways that we want them to how are we supporting them when they make mistakes because they will and they you know <laughs> And what's our ultimate goal is to send out functioning adults in the world who hopefully won't drink too much or get into too much trouble and who will understand that there can be consequences when they do things that aren't smart. Right. You know, and I don't necessarily know, you know, exactly how we get into the nitty gritty of what happens for every single possible infraction. But I guess I would like to see this however we decide where to start consider big picture we want to make sure that we're starting in kindergarten with the intention that by the time they get to middle school they know if they vape or they smoke or whatever there will be these consequences and when they get to that high school party there will be these consequences and i'm not clear right now that that's how we're sort of structuring it and it may be that that's already in place and i'm just not aware of it but i would just like to have that understanding and i agree that's not the same conversation as what is this one issue at the high school agreed mm -hmm. hope I do agree that it's various conversations, which is why I think it does, the policy committee conversation is still important to inform the board discussion. Stakeholders are important to inform the board discussion. And, and I do feel like um, 
again, it's not necessarily either or, it's and both. I mean, how our approach, when we decide how we approach things in a district, that informs policy, which informs procedures and informs our superintendent, our assistant superintendent, how procedures roll out in various buildings. And so to me, while yes, it is two different conversations per se, there, there's a lot of alignment in, in those conversations. So if we're having a convert broader conversation around our philosophy and how we're approaching, and I do think that needs to be a K-12 conversation, do we need to start at kindergarten? I'm fine starting in high school if there's more pressing issues there and working our way back and then making sure that there's alignment. I, I just wanna make sure we're not having the conversations in silo of one another that there's not some joint alignment going through, although procedurally it, it is going to play out differently in, in each building and grade levels. Um, but I, I do think that, that we can only cover so much ground even in a work session, even in a long work session. Um, but I, I would like to see us take up the high school conversation and I, I do think it's important, again, if we have a work session around the approach, again, that can inform more readings to the policy committee of how they're looking at this particular um, policy as well. Margo, could I speak? Yes, sorry, Nancy, go ahead. Oh, okay, I know it's hard to see. Um, I, I think it's too much in one work session to talk about both issues. So I think this board right now either, need, either has to decide whether to talk about the K-12 discipline policy or just talk about the high school. The stakeholders for the high school will involve many people, the athletic director, the music director, the principal, maybe a couple of parents will come, you know, students will come. It's gonna be a large group of people, the high school, did I say the high school principal? Um, there'll be a lot of people there. So it's too much to do both issues in one work session. So I think we need to decide which one we wanna do. I frankly think we should do the high school because that's the immediate concern as, as Hope just mentioned, but it's a decision of the board which way it wants to go. Conversation? Lisa? I would be fine with starting with the high school as long as we have the intention to look more broadly at K-12 as we proceed and maybe it would require scheduling a separate work session later this year, but I wouldn't like to kick that K-12 discussion too far down the road. Mm -hmm. Like I'd love to see that happen this school year if we can, yeah. but yes. I completely understand if there's urgency to the high school, if people want to start there, you know. Yep. Um, Lisa, I, and I apologize to you. You had mentioned that several times to put on as a future agenda item and, and we never did that. So I apologize for that. It should have been on there a long time ago. So yes, we will do it um, as soon as we can. Yep. Uh, I, I agree with Nancy that, that the um, high school, addressing the, the high school and getting those people in probably makes a lot of sense next week on such a short time frame um, rather than trying to get people from all levels. But um, I'm concerned that if we don't have a, a, a more, um, a broader conversation about our philosophies, then we won't have that to guide whatever we're deciding about this policy. So I'm wondering if we can at least make some time in the beginning of that meeting to, um, to, to understand what has been the previous sort of philosophy and um, how our district deals with discipline right now and then to talk a little bit about whether that fits with our goals and, um, and the way this current board sees uh, how we wanna handle discipline and behavioral support. Oh. Um, I, I would just propose, can we can we not as a board commit to the same way we commit to budget commit uh, a schedule? Work session. Uh, work session, a work, I'm sorry, I can't speak tonight. A work session schedule. Um, I don't wanna see it kick the can down the road all the way until June, but we do have board meetings and policy meetings lined up in between now and then, and if we need to add in some additional ones as well, I would like to just see us put together a work schedule around the topic of disciplinary approach because it's not just, if we're looking at this policy, this policy is an off-campus policy. We have other off-campus policies that, in my opinion, play out sometimes not in the most positive lights. We have on-site policies, so if we're really looking at a broader approach 
um, to our, our policy approach and um, to students, then I do feel like it's going to take work sessions and agenda items, but we're also going to have normal agenda items, so we don't want to be here till midnight on those nights. So is that something people would be willing mm -hmm. to? Yeah. So then we're committed to some time frames yeah. instead of mm -hmm. just whenever we can get it back on the agenda. Nancy and I can work up a schedule for that based mm -hmm. on where we know we need to go. And, and I would say, um, you know, having been involved in discipline, I think it's a run at both directions on the flagpole. We have to look at um, not just the philosophy, but also our responsibility to building building the tool belt for handling scenarios that kids will face. And so I think when done properly, when the conversation happens both directions, you arrive at a clear philosophy that then filters in to the policies. And that is going to take several d discourse and dialogues to reach clearness for, for the board. And to forward. hear from the stakeholders that exactly. Steve was talking about. Because we have policy, but we also have to recognize that each policy that we make has procedural Practice. purposes. And yep. those procedures do not look the same by grade level all the time. So I just want people to understand that, right. that there's two <laughs> legs here. Yep that have to be considered. So it, sounds, so it sounds like I'm aware of time and the need to move the conversation forward. We have a tentative meeting work session for next Thursday, one second, Liz, which would be our first of several work sessions related to discipline with a focus only on the high school. We will invite stakeholders to present policies, how they're carried out, and have an open discussion and format with the board and the stakeholders mm -hmm. to be an information gathering session. We'll use that to help filter more questions to go to our next worst session, which would probably be middle school and so on and so forth. Great, Lisa. One quick request if we're focusing on high school, if possible, I'd love to have a few student representatives from some of our key constituents be sort of like not just part of public comment, but sort of part of the stakeholder group. I mean, if we can get somebody from Honor Society or somebody who's heavily involved in sports or somebody who's heavily involved in music, I would like to have some chance to hear a little bit from the kids if we can, mm -hmm. rather than just limiting them to sitting for public comment. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Agreed. Liz. Um, so I just want to say this, <clears throat> that um, I think starting with the high school is appropriate because I think, you know, like Lisa was saying, she wants to, we want to understand how we're preparing our kids in middle school for uh, high school and how we're sort of integrating across the board. But the reality is most of the kids that are running into juvenile statutes are in high school. And I think that we should use the juvenile statutes because we are um, under the state's jurisdiction and not set our kids up that, oh, you're only going to get a slap on the wrist. but you know, as soon as you turn 16, you might be charged an adult, or when you turn 18, you're definitely going to be charged an adult, and it's not going to be a slap in the wrist anymore. So I think we have to work under the juvenile protocols, uh, or excuse me, the juvenile uh, statutes and protocols. And so I'd ask that, um, so I think it's appropriate that we sort of start there to understand what the state laws are surrounding some of these things and, and integrate. So I guess I'd ask that we invite the uh, resource officer from the high school and maybe even the juvenile prosecutor in Portsmouth to also attend if available. Um, because I do think if we're talking discipline, we're also dealing with state statutes. And I think we need to be mindful of of those, of that fact and, um, and how that plays into, you know, what we're doing here and and I guess my only other concern is that how are we going to and maybe we decide at that point how are we going to pull some of the information that Carrie has as a professor at UNH where are we going to be looking for um, journals and information are we just going to rely on whatever the high school principal says is best practice or are we going to rely on who are we relying on I guess uh, to determine best practice and, and where we're pulling information from. I understand having a group of stakeholders is great, um, you know, and maybe people can bring that information forward at that meeting, but I think we, um, we should really um, target some of those things as well uh, in doing that. Thanks. Oh, Carrie. Thanks. Yeah, I just, I'm happy to put some things together. And like I said, the, I, I know in substance, use prevention efforts the life of an athlete program is very involved um and so i think that's a great partner in this i think though i do want to be cautious and just maybe sort of make sure that we um like liz i know your role with the criminal justice system is 
like your lens, right? But making sure that we're not, you know, we're not enforcers, we're not police, this is school policy, those legal proceedings and things like that are, are very separate. So I would see these policies as really being the guidance, very, like making sure that there's a clear line of separation from um, laws and enforcement. Mm -hmm. So let's agree okay. to the work session as a starting place of the conversation. And I know that good questions and research will follow from that by which we will follow up with them or Nancy and I will put together several work session plans which we can amend as we go based on our needs and our questions. But we'll agree to the 21st. We will uh, make that public notice. We will find ways to make sure students are aware of it. And we will start there. At, in a addition to the dialogue that will begin tomorrow in the policy committee specifically related to policy IGD. And that information will be brought forth will be to the board. shared, yep. Okay. yep. Summarized, shared, uh, um, minutes will be posted. So, and so on that note, I think I propose that we are ready to move on to um, one last thing. Oh, sorry, Ann. I just wanted to mention that our job is to determine and, and create policy, uh, and and the uh, the procedure is not our job to That's deal right. with. But we need to know what the procedure is. Mm -hmm. We don't determine the procedure. Yep. But we need to know what it is. Great clarifying point. The Sorry, just to clarify though, the procedure is actually in the policy. So if we're creating the policy, then we're also putting into the policy well, the some of the procedure. The, the procedure so, is done. Uh, no, in, the, in our policy, there is actually a procedure in place. So I think that's what's concerning is that we need to make sure if we have a policy that actually states a procedure that it is actually following what may be required of due process or or maybe we need to update based on the new understanding of due process or property rights essentially so i think you know i don't know i mean this might be above my pay grade it might be above kathleen's pay grade i don't know you know but i think we need to understand and take a look at it and if we need to get somebody do you know an admin attorney to look at it we might need to have that yeah. happen well, too well, the procedure is their job yep Okay, so uh, administrator report. So yeah, so that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was moving in that direction. Do you want to share anything else tonight, Steve? <laughs> I dare not. No. Uh, so as I mentioned right before we broke for that, we did have one letter of resignation. Oh, Faith Masterson is in your packet. Uh, the rest of the administrator report, uh, we're going to talk more money, and I'm going to turn it over to Nathan. <laughs> Perfect. Good luck, Nathan. <laughs> Nathan. So folks, the, the financial report was in your packet. Let me start there uh, and draw your attention to a couple of things. Uh, the news continues to be the same, so I won't belabor it uh, in the interest of time. But remember, we have had a fair number of vacancies, and so in the salary area, you continue to see vacancies uh, driving some surpluses. Uh, I would tell you by way of projection that I do expect in the, in the, uh, uh, in the cost of salaries for teachers, there were some um, some emissions in the budget in that cycle uh, of increases the teachers, uh, I want to say, increment, incremental changes in terms of uh, degrees and such. So I do anticipate that that line will run um, pretty close. Uh, with, with hiring, we managed to make some savings that will make up for a bunch of it, but I think we'll probably see a small, um, a small shortfall in teachers. But in the area of clericals, custodials, maintenance, you're going to see surpluses. Substitutes, if you look, so here's one of the, here's one of the things I look at, right? If you, act, if you look at your actual year to date in substitutes, it's essentially the same as the budget for the whole year. So that line unadjusted is going to run 130 to 150,000 over budget. But one of the things that I expect we'll do is adjust, because we always seem to miss some of the long-term substitutes who become the teacher because the, mm. the teacher who was on leave is no longer being paid for leave. They're out on an extended unpaid period. And so the salary really should not stay in the substitute line. It should shift um, all in. I think you're going to see salaries land at the end of the year in the positive measurably, probably 150,000 or so. Um, uh, if you peekaboo through the rest of the report, we have talked in the past about a couple of lines that I think you'll see deficits in. In the area on the second page of system-wide psychology, we've had some uh, uh, some additional evaluations that have been done by third party entities and so that line is going to run over uh, in the area of uh, 
uh, special ed, I think you're going to see that PEEP will carry a balance a surplus because it's showing that now, and some of that's about timing with payment of bills uh, month over month in this rolling average that we use for the plan. But I believe that there's some contracts that have not been necessary because of the population this year. You will see us over budget in the area of out-of-district tuition, although I don't think it's going to be uh, an enormous number. It certainly will fit within the rest. In the area of school board, we had costs related to the search that would take, we'll take that line into the negative. Um, but you're going to see savings in the central office line above it that will more than offset. And I think that uh, there are savings in insurance, that 25,000 and change that you see in line 183 insurance, that's a real savings that won't go away. Um, I think uh, Mr. Lynchy will balance out in his maintenance and energy ultimately as he does most years and there's some margin in pupil transportation that might be negative. All in though, I think if you were to look at the bottom line, I expect right now that we'll probably finish somewhere between $100,000 and $150,000 surplus as we did in the last period. Um, I'm just trying to chase. I'm just trying to chase uh, a couple of those details in projections. We continue to we continue to move ourselves forward. Hopefully, with the addition of the accountant to the staff, that position is posted and not yet filled. It'll it'll be it'll be very helpful to have a, a, a partner in looking at the projections, looking at the encumbrances, and trying to figure out line by line and category by category how we're standing relative to uh, relative to budget. Um, right now, I do a lot of things at 35,000 feet, and it's it's difficult to be as finite there as I'd like to be. So, but I think all in, um, no no bad news, just uh, some pluses and some minuses, um, but but a, a good solid financial position right now. Oh. I'm not sure if this is for you or for Steve, but I'm just curious. Those um, special ed and the out of system psychologists. Do we think <clears throat> that those that having to go outside for services will continue to increase as we're trying to, you know, close some of our gaps? Or do we think that some of the positions that we've requested, um, you know, for next year that's on our budget will help alleviate some of that pain? Yeah, I, I would say we've, you know, given thought to the budget to how to reduce out of district or out of or contracted service costs to uh, associate with those kinds of services in terms of the the money explanation, I don't know if Nathan has anything else to add. Yeah, I think if uh, if you had Ms. Souther back here again tonight, she would remind you that in a couple of those categories, and psychology is one of them, she puts in a placeholder, and I think in this case her placeholder is 5000 or 8000 for external evals. And some cycles, many cycles, she uses it not at all, but in in the odd cycle, she ends up with just the right combination of folks uh, students whose situations require a second opinion, they require a second eval, and she reaches outside, uh, either because of the volume to be served or the nuance of each particular case. In this case, she's been hit with a slew of evals, and I don't know that that's something that would necessarily replicate itself in the next cycle. Okay. So in that area, I think um, I think she would say, you know, I, I, you win some, you lose some, some years it's more or less. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, that's, you want me to keep going? Yep, you're up for ESSER funds. I'm going to go get to the microphone, if you don't mind. Sure. So I can see everybody, and then I have to give me just 30 seconds. I'll wake up Mr. Lynchy because I know he's up early at 9 in the morning. <laughs> and I swore he'd come visit with me and share. That's his best time. So let me, uh, let me thank you for your patience. I know we've covered a lot already this evening. Um, and the superintendent shared, uh, this is a perspective I don't see very often. This is interesting. Hi, guys. Um, and uh, Nick appreciates this perspective much better than when I'm behind the, the wheel of my car and he's trying to cross the street at the school. Uh, everybody has, I think the superintendent already shared with you the raw data. What's at your seat tonight are three pieces and that I'll talk to in each, uh, each a little bit. First, just slides so that you have a copy of what we'll go through tonight. The green sheet is a revised copy of, uh, of uh, suggestions for uh, use of funds. 
this packet that you each have, and I emailed these, all of these documents to Carrie and to Nancy as soon as the meeting started, and I knew who wasn't going to be with us. Uh, oh, oh, oh. This, this packet includes the fall survey results, the, the, this winter, the February survey results, as well as some, um, some floor plans that we'll share. I, all of this will become public, and we put this uh, along with the packet uh, when uh, Paulette posts it, except those floor plans. I keep that, we're not gonna put that in the slides and stuff, only because for security purposes, I'd hesitate to throw those things out on the, on the World Wide Web. Uh, but I, I wanted to, tonight I'm not certainly looking for any action uh, from the board, only to try to make sure that you've had the opportunity moving forward to consider all this data, the way that I've cleaned it up to match what you got in the, in the fall. And then we wanna take a couple of minutes to, we want to take a couple of minutes after quickly reviewing the the, fee, the feedback that was received. I won't go through line by line. You guys can take that if you haven't already and look through it some more. But I uh, want to talk to you about air handling and conditioning because one of the biggest capital items that we'd recommend for use of some of these ESSER funds moving forward is to advance uh, upgrades in air conditioning throughout the buildings. So I brought Mr. Lynch so we could talk to that. And then I'll briefly review that uh, revised list of um, proposals for you and it's just more information that we continue to um, to cull through to help in the decision making as we move forward with our ESSER dollars. So first up I guess I would just walk you through briefly uh, the first survey uh, to collect some public feedback about the use of ESSER funds and our priorities went out in the fall. Oh wait even better let me read let me go back and remind you of the funds that we're talking about. There were three rounds that we now call ESSER. We weren't calling it that at the beginning, but today we call them ESSER. ESSER stands for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. The first was that CARES Act, and in many com conversations you'll have everything's CARES Act. It's all CARES Act money or COVID money, but the CARES Act was the first. Those funds have already been consumed. There was $286,000 that we had. And we've talked in the past about the items that we spent that on. There was some technology and there's a lot of PPE as we launched through or we, we rolled through the early months uh, of, of uh, the pandemic and then had to face op reopening of our schools. So those dollars were ESSER 1. Today really what we're talking about are ESSER 2, which come from the CRISA Act and ESSER 3, which is from the ARP Act. Uh, ESSER 2 for us, is a dollar amount just over 1.2 million, and ESSER 3 represents a little more than 2.7 million. All in, it's just shy of $4 million of ESSER funds that we're talking about setting priorities for. The first, the first batch of that is uh, due to be spent not later than September of 23, and the larger amount not later than September of 24. But for all of our other purposes, I'm combining the two, and we'll ultimately allocate the costs most appropriately against wherever it's most advantageous. The rules differ slightly, uh, especially in terms of uh, the application and approval process that we'll go through. ESSER 2 is pretty open-ended to anything related to COVID that goes back to the national announcement of an emergency back in March of 20. Uh, ESSER 3 is a little more stringent in terms of propose it and have it approved first, and then you can go ahead and do it and be reimbursed later but we'll, we'll shift things that serves the best interest of the district. So the first survey, for a small number of board members, uh, you were in the community, probably participated in the survey, but weren't here maybe necessarily when we did some of the analysis and talked about it, but that feedback was 169 responses that came to the survey that we put out uh, right at the beginning of October. Coming away from those 169 responses, we did come up with some recurring themes, additional staffing, social emotional learning, uh, our student uh, addressing learning loss uh, related to the pandemic, facility upgrades in general, and then a kind of a catch-all of other. And I've tried to continue to apply those. I've added in the later survey, I've added outdoor education because there was a lot of conversation about that in the feedback that we received. But otherwise, trying to find some linear sense of, of the community feedback that ties to those themes. So. What you have in your thicker packet, uh, the next slide, shows you the stakeholder feedback in terms of who was responding. Uh, for what it's worth, we had 169, um, 169 respondents. 96% of those fall in the category of 
parents, educators, or both. Uh, and so we heard from the folks very much involved uh, and impacted by how these funds might impact our students, their students. Uh, next is the, the question that we asked about learning loss. We recognized when we put the, the, the survey out at that point that we definitely had to, we had to consider the 20% mandatory set aside for learning loss. Certainly not difficult for us because so many of our priorities align with, with the definition of learning loss. In this case, two themes came out most loudly in the feedback from the community. One was targeted and small group instruction to meet the needs of students as well as adding personnel for academic intervention. Uh, so again, that's in your packet. And then the free form uh, open feedback uh, that came is in the packet. All of the, all of the open responses uh, are there, raw, although I've, I've formatted them so that we can check some boxes and see uh, some, uh, some uh, themes emerging. Again, uh, the counts are at the end so you can get a sense. To be honest, as you look through the three different questions and the three data sets, I toyed with the idea of offering up a positive and negative count because, for instance, in, in some of the conversations, there were both positive comments and negative comments. And so before you look at counts and say, oh, look, lots of feedback about that, it doesn't mean it was all feedback of the same ilk. In some cases, there were, there were for and against comments included. So it's certainly worth digging into. And I could take another swing at this if we wanted to come up with a, a metric that, that really offered some greater insight. But for right now, it was more about how, how frequently did this topic find its way into the, the minds of the, the respondents. So, so all of that is the fall 21 survey that we did in October, and you have that. Next up is the more recent survey that we launched in uh, February. There were 94 responses. And I would say to you again, just for information's sake, that uh, parents and educators in this case made up 94.7%, so not 96, but almost 95%. We had more folks that identified themselves as community members, uh, which was good, so that we'd have more of that feedback. And there were more representatives, if you look at the next slide and contemplate uh, the stakeholders, there were more representatives from some of the additional categories that, that we used. So that you know, if you haven't already, uh, tied not to ESSER 2, but to ESSER 3, ARPA, uh, are some additional reporting and uh, transparency requirements that included uh, a school reopening plan and an ESSER use of funds plan. Those are posted on our website under school board. You can find that on the, in the school board, um, school board section. Uh, they're also posted on the New Hampshire Department of Education website. And those have to be maintained or updated and revised every six months as we as we, uh, as we make any necessary changes. Certainly in the use of funds plan, there's more likelihood that we'll have great uh, impact uh, in revisions as we go. In the uh, reopening of schools, not so much. But because of that, these categories that we asked on the survey, they tie back to the stakeholder, um, the stakeholder commentary that we have to offer up as a part of those plans. How many people did you hear from in this category, in this category? They don't ask specifically what the feedback was, but was there feedback that was shared and how was it considered in the course of the de decision making overall? So there were 94 responses to this survey. We asked, go ahead, that was great, George. We did ask about, uh, the, we asked that same open feedback question. And again, I tried to tie it back to the, um, the same categories now with the addition of uh, outdoor education. Two additional themes popped out. Uh, one uh, in this case was a major focus on the primary grades. Now, there was a, 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 a number, there's a multitude of different ways to best address our primary grades, but at least reference to the, the priority of, of paying attention to this population I thought was important to note. Additionally, there was frequent reference to intervention, intervention and interventionist. A fair amount of that spoke to high school mathematics, but, but many of the comments were broader than that and just looked for greater levels of intervention um, in, in at least two or three, four cases maybe, it referred, I think, uh, more specifically to early intervention, uh, again, back to the primary grades. So, so again, all of that feedback is there with you. We asked the second question this time, which was feedback on 
the proposal, if you will, will, if you will, which is the green sheet that you have, although the old version of that, which was, I don't know, purple or pink or whatever color paper I grabbed that night. So it was, that was part of what we presented here in your public sessions as well as in the forums, so we asked specifically about that. Uh, certainly some meaningful data in that response, that's five or six pages worth of feedback. Uh, I will say, I would make the observation that as we, as we continue to do these surveys and we collect more and more information, our community, our educators and parents become far more uh, generous with words. So there's a, there's a lot more data um, and they're quite willing now, they've figured out the way this Google survey thing is working, they're quite willing to bang a space and add some more thoughts and bang another space and add some more thoughts. So, so I think if you go back and look at it, you'd see in the first survey, this comment referred to this particular theme. Now it's this comment refers to all of the themes or at least two or three of them. So the numbers look a little different again with the counts, but all, all of this was to just try to give you some sense of uh, what might be in the, what might be in all that data, but I'd encourage you, on your most uh, on your slowest of days or nights, to to skim through them if you haven't already, because there's some some interesting data in there. We held public forums in the same time frame that we did the uh, that we did those uh, that second survey. Public forums. Uh, one was in person at uh, Portsmouth High School, and the second night we did it. It was on Zoom. There were. Uh, small number uh, of folks participating in each, especially relevant, you know, in, in relation to the number of responding folks to the surveys, but themes that popped out, although fairly similar, included air conditioning at the high school in the language wing, uh, intervention, uh, a number of comments about formalizing, uh, more formally, uh, outdoor spaces for, um, for programming and for casual use of students during the day, uh, at all levels, in fact. Kindergarten classroom support, again, more focus on the primary grades and uh, continued focus, obviously, on uh, social emotional learning and mental health. So, um, I wanted to draw, we'd had questions asked a couple of times or the suggestion made that we could start the process of trying to tie together for some folks, at least in the community, how we've already begun to address some of the things that have come out in the survey. So I would offer to you one survey respondent specifically called out occupational therapy. You have added an occupational therapy position in uh, the FY23 budget request. There was a, a couple of times it was mentioned that special ed, sta uh, special ed staffing should be in. So it's important to note for everybody that there are four and a half new positions specific to students with IEPs, identified student population and the needs of that population in the FY23 budget that will, is on its way to the City Council. There was a comment about additional counselors and your budget adds uh, one counselor, a guidance counselor, full position at the middle school. Uh, in the conversation that you had with Principal Davis as well as uh, with uh, Director of Special Student Services, uh, uh, Souther, I know you talked about the shifting and the adding of positions, the shifting of duties, uh, two positions there, a reading position as well as a guidance position um, ultimately being created in this process. There was a comments about interventionists I've mentioned and we added a math tutor at the middle school to the budget for 23. There were a number of questions or comments that, that, made, that were made about materials. Supplies for this, books for this, software for this, et cetera. And I would remind you and the public that in your FY23 proposed uh, budget, the first thing we did with operating costs was claw back $317,000 of reductions that were made in the previous cycle. So there are significant dollars that were added across the budget uh, in the buildings and in the departments to restore funds that they had had in the fiscal 21 cycle that they don't have this year in fiscal 22. So there, there should be the opportunity to address many of those needs that were, that were uh, pr proposed in the feedback. And then in the positions that were both called out social work and outdoor ed, right now those continue to be in our ESSER proposal for fiscal 23 and beyond. Uh, and remind you, even before we get there, in both cases we talked about funding them fully in 23 and partially 50-50, hopefully with the district in 24, so that they would blend their way into the budget in 25 and beyond. So that's survey results. So 
I would say consider consider that uh, information. Again, no action tonight. We can certainly <coughs> take questions at the end, but, I, but take that survey information, look through that. Um, all of this will become part of the packet so that the public can look back at this synthesized data for uh, any information that they might be interested in. All right, so I want to shift now to um, air handling, talk about air conditioning. So <clears throat> Mr. Lynch is here to join me and help out. He's good with this off the cuff, but I would just comment for you. As of summer of 2019, when we completed the work at New Franklin, all of your schools, and this is now with the exception of the old Sherburne School that is still awaiting its capital repair or replacement, um, all of our schools had comprehensive air circulation that provides for fresh air as well as for uh, heating. That's across the board. So we were in a very strong position relative to some of our colleagues around the state when COVID hit because one of the things that they, many of them scrambled for was just the ability to bring fresh air into the classrooms and push, push used air out. And we have those circulation systems in place. Not air conditioning to cool every space, but we certainly have air circulation and that comprehensive ventilation that you would expect in a contemporary space. So that was true in all of our five, those five schools. Today, I can tell you that at the middle school, we are fully air conditioned for cooling throughout Portsmouth Middle School. As of this summer, work that will start at the end of school in May, excuse me, June, don't get anybody excited. Uh, school gets out in June, we'll go to work on New Franklin and they will have full air conditioning for cooling throughout New Franklin this summer. Um, we did so obviously for those of you that came through that school because it's landlocked between two, two highways and for noise and for air quality, it was uh, uh, the right combination for that facility. Dondero has limited air conditioning. Little Harbor has limited air conditioning. And at the high school, there's air conditioning, uh, Kenny would tell me, in roughly 70% of that building. Um, and so, again, it's not in the slides, but what I wanted to do was speak to some of the questions that have been asked by the board and to preface some of the requests that we might make as a part of the ESSER funding. And so if you go to the thicker packet that is with you, there is first Dondero, and then Little Harbor, and then Portsmouth High School. Um, you'll see a Dondero schematic first that includes only a few small hints of yellow, which speak to areas at Dondero Elementary that are already air conditioned. Um, and that includes the administrative, the main office, uh, the computer space. Um, so to give you some sense of estimates, for upgrade to, in, to air condition Dondero fully is roughly $2 million. If you were to look at, and I guess I should back up and say, part of the conversation to share this with you is to make sure you're aware, but it's also to try to sensitize you uh, in your quest to help us <laughs> make choices because these get very difficult. And here's, what, here's why, I guess the, the, the evidence explains itself. So, around $2 million to do the whole building. If you flip to the second page of Dondero, you'll see four breakouts, if you will. Now these are systems already in place for the aforementioned ventilation and movement of fresh air and, and recirculation. To, to add conditioning for cooling, unit one, roughly 800,000. And so you see all of those classrooms impacted by that, that section. To add at unit two, another 800,000. So that would pick up essentially all of the instructional spaces in the building, $1.6 million at Dondero. And these are very rough numbers sketched based on um, equipment costs that you know continue to rise over time. Uh, but uh, to give us some, some um, sense of scale, unit three would be um, cooled at about a cost of 200,000 and then unit four at a cost of 200,000. So all in roughly 2 million for the building. But if for instance, I said to you, you have 800,000 to spend, you could do unit one or you could do unit two. You'd have to decide between these classrooms and these classrooms. Doesn't mean that, I mean, there's, there's really no way to judge necessarily that either of them are better. 
certainly as you look at the relative costs as we look at the other buildings, there are some solutions that come at a lower cost because of some of the details that Mr. Lynchy would speak better to. But, uh, but it's difficult to say, well, just do more of this. Well, if I can't do all of that, how do I do half of it? That's, I guess, my point. If you flip then to Little Harbor, Little Harbor could be, uh, could be cooled at a cost of roughly $3 million. And so in Little Harbor, I have, it's not color coded and broken out, but the information is fairly straightforward. You'll find around the, on the first page of Little Harbor, you'll find the kindergarten wing. Those are the K's on the left, wrapping itself around the gymnasium and the cafeteria, the, uh, the home of the old central office, I think, before me, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. the cost there about $550,000. If you flip to your next page and you cool the first floor at a cost of about $950,000. You flip to the second page, or the third page, I should say, and see floor number two, unless I have those reversed. You look at the second floor and the costs, very, I mean not costs, the comments very clearly that you have read and heard is obviously second floor gets hotter than first floor, uh, heat rises and that's a difficult space. But just do the second floor where there's only one small, one small piece right now, the library that's air conditioned, eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. If you flip back to your first page of Little Harbor and contemplate the cafeteria and then the art and music spaces that are right there across from the main office, those combined would run at a cost of about two hundred and ninety thousand. And then the gymnasium, which has air circulation and movement now, but not cooling. So we're able to move air in there, uh, even through the summer months, uh, just not cooling it. But that's 360,000 more. So one of the comments that I know uh, Kenny could make if he, he's awake, that's good. Um, one of the, he prepped me so well, see, that I'm talking and he's wondering when he's gonna talk. And I don't know how much, I, you guys have to ask questions because he got me so warmed up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he, uh, he really did. I've dragged him in the office three times today. So uh, you, 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 you walk in and out, you bring your kids in and out, you walk by, you stare at. It's, Little Harbor's not built to put a lot of rooftop stuff on it the way that some of the other flat roof schools are. So one of the big concerns that drives costs up at Little Harbor is trying to figure out, one, how to locate, where to locate some of these units, and two, how to Describe for me, how do you want to describe it, sound and... Part chiller, where it's just a winding ground. It, it's, winding, it's just winding. And, and you want to you you encase them, you want to encase them and drive sound up. And so <laughs> doing that on a, on a roof that's not flat is, is um, it, it adds some challenge and it adds some expense. So the third building that has need is Portsmouth High School and that's the, you know, the last three pages in your packet. In that packet, you'll see uh, yellow. I didn't make the. I didn't give you a key to tell you. Yellow is air conditioned, and the bluish, whatever color it shows up on that photocopy, um, the darker color is not air conditioned. So we're talking about initially the space that is the language wing on the second floor upstairs, and it's a horrible space. It's hot, and it, so um, we're talking about addressing that, and in the same process making, um, taking corrective action with our chillers because we need to be able to support the capacity of adding additional rooms uh, and that cost all in is somewhere around $600,000. What I haven't estimated yet, or I, I, what he hasn't estimated with his friends and neighbors yet, uh, our first floor costs at Portsmouth High School, but I would suggest that our CTE center comes online in the list of priorities for the state of New Hampshire for capital upgrade and improvement in the foreseeable future, meaning the five, six, seven year CIP range. It's very reasonable for us to expect that when we engage with state support to tackle upgrades at CTE, that we could address air conditioning on, uh, in those other areas on the first floor. Many of them are CTE spaces. Uh, and, and those that aren't, I think it would be a solid investment for Portsmouth to find dollars at that time to, to tackle that at the same time. So we haven't, we, haven't made the uh, we haven't made an assessment or estimate right now of what those costs would look like. Mm -hmm. 
And as an FYI, the New Franklin project this summer is about $1.1 million to, to upgrade what has already been in place since 2019, which is air handling and, and provide cooling, air conditioning. You've got to have at least one hard question for him before he runs away. <clears throat> I have a question, and this might not be directly to AC, but I know in some of those elementary spaces in particular, they're not what would seem structurally to be the most energy efficient spaces in a variety of ways. And I'm just curious, as part of this, if we're thinking long term about anything that might make those spaces just better at holding the cold air if we're going to spend all this money <clears throat> pumping it in. I mean, especially Little Harbor, I mean, it's roasting in there. And you don't want to turn it into a dungeon, but there is a lot of glass. <laughs> well, there is a lot of glass, but we've also put the proper shading and shades in there. But that also goes back to our insulation of the facility. So gotcha. it's holding the heat. So now we want to have it hold the cold. Go up to the microphone. Oh, sorry. sorry. So it is holding, it's holding the heat. Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot of infrastructure. We've done some resealing of the soffits um, as part of the construction projects over the last, we started that one in 2015. Okay. Um, so we've done extra preventive measures to go ahead and start losing because if you looked at Little Harbor back before that, we never had an ice issue around the building because of the pitch. We have an ice issue now. You know, we're also constantly on the sidewalks doing things, trying to correct it, re-divert it. So we're trying to look at those. We've done a lot of energy measures, um, looking at New Franklin as a model back in 2012, and then we shifted that through all the other schools. And as Nathan stated here, when we looked at our construction projects, we ensured that we upgraded the electrical system coming in from Eversource so that we can handle this electrical load. Um, and we've been evaluating the high school load over the last two weeks to try to accommodate the foreign language wing and a few other, other things that we're gonna be trying to do as well. So we didn't have to come back and look for additional funds. So we're trying to do the infrastructure and then try to move forward as well. Oh. Oh. Um, so I'm not sure who to direct this question to and, um, and it's pretty loaded, so I apologize for that. But as I look down the agenda and see the the item of redistricting committee. <laughs> I have to ask, right, and I know you think about all these things, Kenny, probably Possibly. in your sleep. Um, but as we're talking about this, mm -hmm. you know, we're already talking about two of our elementary schools are, are needing more space, Correct. right? We yes. have one elementary school that's gone down in population. And so how is all those things coming into play before we spend millions of dollars to to cool buildings that maybe we'll be using that space, maybe won't be using that space, maybe that space would be used differently. Are we going to be adding on to spaces that would need air conditioning? Would we be converting some of the space into something else down the road and maybe it didn't need to be air conditioned? I don't, I don't know. I'm just. Well, you, each, each project you have to take one step at a time. So we, we have also looked at that as well to a point. Uh, we have. A, when we did the design plan for New Franklin, looking at what is the future. Right. And we have plans on two additions there. Okay. Two classrooms and another workspace slash support service area. So we understand what that and where the mechanical system either can tie in or not. Okay. Or is that brand new? We also did the same thing with Dondero as well. We also look at a couple different areas, put additions on in case where they are bursting at the seams with the, uh, with the student enrollment. Okay. Um, to see where we can do that, but it won't inf intrude. I won't, you know, the systems that we're putting in play now won't be affected. Those systems will need, those areas will need additional systems to be added. And that's why we started with the electrical system infrastructure to make sure we can handle additional future loads in the future. And what about for Little Harbor if we don't see that we will you see that whole building or would we be potentially have we discussed using it in other ways if we're redistricting and it's not filled or you I, know, mean, I don't want to I don't want to I, I love to have AC yeah. everywhere but I also don't want to spend money on AC if a room's going to be empty for three years but we have or, the control to shut those rooms off oh okay. yes so if you for the laptops we, everything is we call DDC digital control we can have access I have access to my laptop out back where we can modulate temperatures, AC, shut them off, turn them on, heats, controls. We have 100% control on the back end. Mm -hmm. So if we know areas that are limited, we can set time frames 
um, schedules, um, you name it, we have that capacity of control. So if the building's not being used in certain areas, such as the high school in the summer, we don't AC the whole building. Okay. We just AC where the custodians and the admin are working. Right. And but then we just shift it throughout the building. But we're still paying for the install of that versus... Correct. The, yes. You know, yep. putting it in or capping it somewhere and then just having it capped where it could be added later yes. based on what we know the, the building use is going to be. It, would that be cost savings to us at any point? As of right now, I haven't found a space in any of the schools that are not being used, including the closets, okay. as support services. All right. Thank you. <laughs> but I, 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 would say, I would say that one of the things that Kenny's... So some of these systems, without digging too deep into the weeds, some of them are, some of them are adding... Help me describe the difference between um, Piggybacking on the on the existing ventilation with cooling cooled air, as opposed to introducing a separate split. That's oh, I understand that. You know what I mean? Like the, so. Yeah. So it, with vision, we could we could you guys talk better than I. But, <laughs> but we we you know with with vision, we could make some selective choices on some of that. But I think right. on some of them, they are structural. We're we're doing all of it when we're doing it because right. of the way we're talking about doing it for for cost efficiency. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I guess I just wondered, um, I have about three questions here, but I guess the first is like, what are you looking for tonight? Are you, we're looking at these estimates. And so my follow-up questions to that would be, um, if we were to authorize something today, what could actually get started? I think we discussed this previously, how there's sort of this order or back order, or I guess I was wondering about bulk buying, like what are, like what's the practical yeah. timeline we're looking at here? So all of this stuff, remember that we're not looking for any action tonight, just, you know, one more step in, hey, we did another survey, we had public forums, we hadn't had a chance to really talk about all of the results that we got. And we also, I guess I haven't said it out loud yet, but, um, we have the city has stepped away from the invitation or request to commit a significant chunk of these ESSER dollars to the purchase, uh, the acquisition of community campus. That frees up in our planning and conversation a couple of million dollars. Uh, and so quickly, air conditioning and air handling is a, is a quick layup. We need it. It's very much within the, the, the target of the ESSER funding. So many other districts are doing just that. Wanted to share that and bring all of it to you so that you'd continue to have more information in the pile. The reality is we'd have to go to bid and, 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 um, and complete you know, the entire process for procurement. And it's not likely that, uh, even if we tried at this point, I don't think we'd see any of this kind of work happen. New Franklin is already happening. It's already on the books. It's already scheduled and contracted. But the rest of this would have to be for next next year and beyond. Is there any understanding, and maybe this is a, a Ken question, is there any understanding, or maybe Nate's been looking at the numbers, but is there any understanding that maybe we could get a unit here, you know, pick a, pick a space, get a unit here, a unit there, so that these elementary schools um, have the Dondero and Little Harbor have more space this summer. Is there any way to get units into like one particular area, pick an area, have the principal pick an area that'd be most appropriate? Is there any understanding that we could get something in the summer if we were to just say we're going to pick one area in each school? And then my follow up question to that is there any sort of advantage to bulk buying these units? The short end of the story, we've looked at looking at isolated areas in certain areas, um, and it's not cost prohibitive for us to even to look down that avenue, um, just because of the cost. And you're putting a Band-Aid where then you're going to rip it back out to put something else that's going to be the infrastructure that's going to last us 10, 15, 20 years, depending on its, main, its maintenance cycle. So when we, and that's why we're looking at the systems, the VFRs or certain chiller coils um, and looking at what well, we've sent it out for price or for suggestions, what we're working with the admin now, is this is where, yeah, we'll get a bigger buying power because we try to use cost savings when, if we're going to do Little Harbor and Dondero um, and part of the high school is the contractor knows that he's going to be with Portsmouth for the summer. Mm -hmm. So we try to find the cost savings in the labor and, and the site, you know, contractors, you know, being on site 
versus them coming for New Franklin and then leaving, and then three weeks later coming to start the high school and then leave. So we look at that as cost savings. Um, the market is the market on where we can try to get mechanical savings, um, but that price is jumping up roughly every four to four months right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, how do how quickly do we need to act on it to secure a price if these things are jumping up? And I guess I wonder if technology is changing too. And I guess my last my last question I'll throw in there as a as a group of questions. Um, my last question is: New Franklin was CIP bonded. Yes. Um, is there any understanding or is there any sort of uh, pitch that we could actually you know we should be bonding these things and getting them into a CIP versus? Doing ESSER funds, I, I realize that we have freed up ESSER funds, but I think this is the same conversation we had with Seacoast Community School that we're not in the business of buildings. And if we're not in the business of buildings and, and the city actually, in fact, owns the building and the, and the units and all this sort of stuff that comes with the building, then why are we um, putting our ESSER funds to it and could we, you know, could we bond it? Is there some way that we could do this and get it done? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I, I, I would answer it, I guess, this way. The six-year CIP right now does not have air conditioning in it um, because there are other priorities that have been greater facility-wise than addressing what is what can be argued is a short number of days per year concern. There's obviously benefit to uh, air conditioning in the schools many, many days of the year, uh, especially with the controls that allow you to cool smaller portions of the building in the summer months, for instance, to, to, to serve specific program needs. Um, but, but it hasn't been a priority that launches itself into the six-year vision right now in terms of being on the CIP and being bonded. Obviously, these are costs that could be bonded, and if it was a community conversation that made it a greater priority than any number of other things in the CIP, um, then, then it could easily be there. Other things come on to and off the list, uh, you know, depending on the needs of our community and the needs of our, of our facilities and, and properties. But the ESSER funds spoke so specifically to beyond um, PPE and cleaning and safety, it spoke to air handling and air quality. Uh, and so it's been a it's been a real sweet spot, I guess you could say, for so many schools, communities in the state and nationwide. Um, and so for us, it's a it's a one time. And I say that on a subsequent slide. I wanted to call it out. Air conditioning, air handling, air improvement of those systems is a one time investment that can be made that offers benefit for many many years. Uh, uh, and it could be some time before we would see that become a sufficient enough priority to find bonded funds, for instance, to do it. And, and I continue to echo, I think, the recommendation we've made that to the extent possible we should focus ourselves on making one-time investments that have big bang as opposed to creating the cliff effect by staffing up and either having to cut positions or, or then fund them in perpetuity. So, so this the responsible thing to do is to continue to put these kinds of things out before you because they are they are ripe for this kind of funding. Lisa? I had one quick follow-up question that Liz reminded me of. I'm just curious in the short term, are there any funds that you need to address those few days when we might need to close school because of heat? It happened once, and obviously that's not a regular occurrence, but I'm just curious if there's any, not to spend a ton of money on like, a, you know, Band-Aid solutions while you're planning the larger AC investments, but are there any smaller things that we might need just to keep the doors open on those days? So, go ahead. Um, so we do leave the doors open on those days. Um, we, well, okay, I'm um, sorry, but uh, quite literally. There. Um, I mean, we do small measures. I mean, we try to we run the ventilation at night to try to pull in, you know, the cool night air. We try to modulate the based off the CO2 levels to still bring in fresh air during the, during the day, but try to how we can minimize in certain things. Um, what also turns around and on the backside of that is then you got a humidity at night. And I, we just brought it in all night long. So uh, we, we've also supported with, with the COVID funds as there's box fans throughout the building. 
-hmm. where staff can put in and help move more air through the window or out the window or just to try to get some type of physical breeze going that directly on a student or a staff member to give more alternatives. What comes into play is when people say, well, I just want to bring a window unit. Well, then what do you want to lose? Because I have to give a plug load to gain plug load. So we're trying to just refrain from even allowing that piece to come in because um, it's a safety issue and how it's put in, how it's secured, and the plug's not near it, so then I gotta run an extension cord, which is then um, a, a code compliance. So question for both of you. In the numbers that were given, am I understand this correctly, that is just for the device and install? Have we also thought about the impacts that would have on the energy bill? Just curious. I'm saying no. <laughs> as, of, as of right now, no. But we'll 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 get those numbers on what the impact. I mean, it's like with any renovation, we've we've seen some not significant increase. Okay. Um, you know, we've done a really good job in the last ten years to plateau our energy use, and you'll even see it this year as well. Um, it allows with the control of the systems, we can turn on, shut off when we're not occupied, unoccupied you know, COVID world at additional time. Um, at one point we we're running them 20, 22 hours a day and shutting them down for two. Okay. Now we're really back that down where we're pre-flushing and after flushing the facilities um, when they're unoccupied to get them, you know, aired out or however you say that, um, but then pre, pre-cool and pre-heat them as well. So um, yeah, I mean, we, we, so we're gonna start seeing that increase and we'll, we'll work on those numbers once we itemize of how many units that each phase installs in each facility. Yeah. Okay. Right now we don't have that. We have a good number, but we just will fine tune that. Okay. Thanks, yeah. Kenny. Ken, so are those all running off electricity or are we looking at any solar ran? Um, no, they're gonna run all off the, the, the Eversource grid. Okay. Uh, we do have plenty of solar kicking out in most of the schools, some yeah. of its educational purposes. And then we have the grid at the high school, which right. at this point we still don't know. Um, I think you mentioned uh, that that these systems are expected to last 10 to 15 years. Is that what you said? Or well, they're they're just the mechanical parts. So you know, in 10, 15 years, we'll be looking at changing the compressor. There'll be some type of coil. There's, there's always going to be a maintenance piece. Okay, so, so what, we'll start putting how that long piece. How do they typically last? I mean, how, if we were to make these investments, how long? Like, what what kind of longevity are we getting out of that? We're, we're, I mean, we, we try to get as the life of, of full life of any equipment, and we have some equipment at the high school um, that's running on roughly almost 20, 20 years old. Yeah. You know, that's a life cycle of mechanical systems now. Okay. So, and that's where the other flip side of that is, is now we're looking to send out a bid to retro commission a high school to give us a report on where we are with mechanical systems. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have some money earmarked for them in a few years to start looking at some of their needs and upgrades to maintain the fresh air on a daily basis and, and start looking at their systems and create a capital plan even bigger um, for that upgrade. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. So, so let me hit you with a punchline then if we go ahead. Um, <laughs> and again, not, not for you to act on, simply to, simply to try to continue the conversation as the conditions on the ground change, you know, as we become aware of other things. And so, uh, the green sheet that you have speaks to learning loss, uh, learning loss uh, related uses of about eight hundred and forty thousand dollars. That's the first chunk on your green sheet. Uh, infrastructure is two point six nine, almost two point seven million. That's largely air conditioning, and then other uses four hundred and fifty two thousand. We're still a little bit shy with this projection of the three nine nine that. Uh, uh, that is the total amount. But again, not all of these things needed would need to happen right away. Some of these things are, are fiscal 23 kind of targets. Some of them are fiscal 24. So the next slide starts to break them down. And again, the screen sheet breaks it down the same way. I would call out to you that uh, right now we, we have added an interventionist at the high school in year one in fiscal 23. Um, with a similar plan that we've had for the social worker and the outdoor education uh, position, with transition paying 50% in year two, with the hope that in year three we move them to the district fully. Uh, we've added some additional um, software materials to support the interventionist and the other two positions. 
uh, talking software, uh, curriculum materials, et cetera. And then on the next slide, in infrastructure, we've, we've put in, again, these are plug numbers because I just gave you the numbers and they're in your slide to have a sense of what pieces of each of the school you could do. Uh, none of this is proposed or, you know what I mean? There's not a good answer yet because I guess part of what we're looking for is for you as you continue to collect information and feedback to help with the notion of Plenty of comments that I heard that suggested we really should not do cooling zones in the schools, which were some large rooms like the cafeteria and the library where on hot days students could move through the space and have the benefit of a half an hour, 40 minutes where they had a chance to decompress and cool. Maybe doing something, maybe doing not a lot of anything, you know, could be instructional time, could be reading time, could be any number of things. Um, the, the objection, for instance, at Little Harbor was, well, it's a lot hotter on the second floor, you need to do that. Maybe it is, so go ahead and take a look at the map and decide you want to spend 800000 to do the second floor and not do any of the rest of the building. So I'm, I, now when there's, a cold, when there's a hot day and we're trying to use the benefit of the cooling, we've got to move the entire third, fourth, and fifth grade out of the top floor and put them somewhere and still try to be productive in the day. I'm not, I, I'm, not, I'm not in a position right now where I'm not ready to judge or project really what the right answer would be, but you could say let's spend some dollars on, on the second floor, um, but you could also answer the argument, well, those rooms, art and music were in use, well, they'll be in use. Well, no, they won't be in use on a hot day because they'll be in use because everybody will use them as cooling zones, and you won't have art or music on the day that I need the art and music rooms in the cafeteria to be used to the fullest of their ability to help be cooling spaces for the, the rest of the, for the entire school population. So <clears throat> there's lots of ways to target this, but ultimately we'll look for some support and guidance in how to allocate the dollars. So right now I've just plugged 850,000 against Ondero and against Little Harbor each, with the 600,000 which would address pro probably the, the upstairs language space at the high school. Uh, we'll put a, a figure in that is really premature right now. We're working at, uh, at a community campus with an architect that the city has put in place. I met just the other day with staff at the Lister Academy to talk about space needs and contemplate what retrofitting we would have to do. The space we're likely moving into at community campus if the Lister moves there is, uh, it was set up as uh, families first small medical spaces, so there's some demolition and cleanup that has to be done to make those larger classroom spaces. So there are some costs and moving and transition. So we set some dollars aside right now um, uh, without there being a whole lot of backup to that. Additionally, we've got dollars there for elementary outdoor spaces. That could be activity like performance space, kind of a stage, a pavilion. It could just be some covered space like the tents were, but more permanent. I've heard folks talk about uh, being able to lunch outside or being able to, to uh, take breaks outside or, ha or have class work done outside, but wanting the cover uh, to protect from the elements, both the sun and the rain, depending. So we've set some, some dollars aside. At the high school, there's been a conversation for as long as I've been here about securing, it's hard to call it a courtyard, but securing uh, the space interior to uh, but out, out open air space uh, at Portsmouth High School that would allow students to move from wing to wing without having to traverse all the way or go through locked doors. Locking that down with an appropriate, uh, appropriate gate system that would allow for egress uh, and then provide that space not only for moving back and forth but also for outdoor seating, space, uh, what have you at lunch or at break periods. I wondered if uh, community campus was air conditioned. Is it all? Uh, can I say yes. all? <laughs> all of it? Yeah, it is all of it, yes. All of it? Yep. Good. <laughs> I'm saying that because yes. Kenny told me I could say that because I don't know for sure that all of it is, but if he says it is, then that's yeah. great. Liz had a question. I guess is there any understanding, I mean, I, I understand that um, the high school is done a certain way as far as the AC, New Franklin might be done a certain way as, as far as the AC goes. Um, Two million, three million, it's a lot of funds. I understand that there's a process and everything is sort of linked together and there's this technology. But is there any sort of understanding that as technology has progressed that we could get like smaller units like these Mitsubishi units That's into? What we're doing. Okay, so I guess I was just curious. That's what we're looking at now. We're putting okay. Mitsubishi units in the, the, the cassettes in, in the center of the room and then chilling them up to a coil system that can feed multiple rooms at one time. 
Okay. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the newest technology where it's kind of a plug and play, um, but it's the infrastructure that you got to get into the roof penetrations to get the, the compressor lines down through, the power up through, and then the power lines into play. Yeah, so that's that's where the foreign language wing and most of the third floor will have to come into play that way um, because of the building um, structure of 1956. We just don't have that seal and plenum to put the proper ductwork in one big unit. So we're doing multiple units off one chiller multiple units on another chiller throughout that entire area. There's about 15 of them right now um, estimated for the foreign language wing. Okay. I mean, as far as getting them into the elementary school, is there any sort of understanding that once you start putting these newer units in, that maybe the price would go down at all? Uh, we would hope so, yes. I can't so answer that. Go up okay. the longer I just didn't know as yeah. far as with tech. Down. Yeah. No, that's, that's a, we will see where the market is when we start purchasing and put this Inflation. equipment out. We put it out the bit. Okay. We're looking for the best price um, that we can we can get on the market. Speaking of best price, is there um, is there a place when where you've bookmarked this um, money for the outdoor activity spaces and the outdoor airspace at PHS? Might we tap into our architecture students to design and some of our CTE students to help? build some of those spaces since they don't need plumbing and some of the things that we don't offer in CTE? I, I, I think from, from my perspective, we're open to, I mean, I always have to, I always have to take a big deep breath when you start talking about com, commercial work being performed by students right. in terms of construction, but design, those design concepts, and then anything, you know, anything can be vouchsafed by, um, you know, somebody with a stamp. So yeah, there's a lot of things, a lot of legwork that could be done that would really I think add to the personalization of it, for sure. So, great. Oh. Um, thank you for all this information and for the details that you and Kent's work so hard on. Uh, I'm, I just have a quick question around, so the PHS interventionist, is that for math or what is that? Yes. I say, so. Yes, I'm is, sorry I didn't write, I didn't include so that. So is that the extent of what we're do looking at supporting for math because I know that I have requested uh, looking at a deeper dive of more K through 12 wraparound support services and I, forgive me the hour is late so I don't really remember. We have math and P middle school in our budget. Yes. yes. Help yes. me yep. someone. Yes, okay. that's on here. And then, okay, so maybe if I, we could just we're Steve, also, maybe if you could just give, in the, or George, I'm sorry, the next, even the next board meeting, if we could kind of get a, I don't care where the money comes from, just what we're doing <laughs> as a whole for K through 12. <laughs> so, page if seven. you have page seven. seven, oh, okay. So, I, I just wanted to make sure we were doing more for the math support. If you have something to add tonight, George, feel free, but. No, I was just well, saying that in addition to the staffing, we're also looking at software for intervention type software, tier, oh, for okay. tier two and and, uh, and tier three intervention okay. just to support students too. So, so there's a broader it, conversation it, happening. We just don't have all the information right here. But, okay, great. Thank you. Somebody asked, and then yeah. we should, yes. I'll, I'll wrap. Somebody asked, just for perspective's sake, and we could do more of this, but based on the green sheet tonight essentially two-thirds would be targeted in infrastructure if you did it like this and there's not an expectation that this is the final draft this is just more information if you'd use this plan and move forward and completed it two-thirds of that is infrastructure roughly 58 percent of it being air conditioning related uh, there's another 10 percent for other uh, the outside spaces the lister etc Learning loss is about 21, 22% there, uh, and then there another 11% of, of, I'll call it other miscellaneous. So we can, we can break down some more of that uh, as this continues to, to grow and mature in terms of concepts and ideas. And uh, what we wanted more than anything is to make sure that you had all of the results in somewhat of a, a similar format to the past, uh, and that we talked a bit about AIR uh, and made sure you had some greater information and understanding of what what those needs are and what the costs might be for them. So, any other questions or drill down before we? I didn't realize it got so late. I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Nathan. Thank, Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Steve, you are up for um, old business, which is the consideration and approval of some policies that I believe are second reads, except for the sports related. Yeah, so all of these policies are up for second reading, um, given that each of them, every vote tonight has to be taken as a roll call. I guess I would entertain the possibility you could take them as a block of policies. Um, they are all described also in the policy committee meeting minutes, I believe, in this. And all of the changes we did all go over in the last meeting. I don't think there were many changes from that that the policy committee had to deal with uh, in bringing these second readings forward to you. So I have a question about <coughs> PBCA. Is now the time uh, for questions? Do you want to do a motion <coughs> to yeah. and then discuss? Is oh, OK, motion? perfect. Thank you. Move to approve the block of policies. Second. Okay. Discussion? So um, on EBCA, the crisis prevention and emergency response plan um, in the second, well, no, sorry, fourth paragraph, almost second to last paragraph, it looks like. Um, it, I don't really fully understand this. In addition, the board directs the superintendent to ensure that each emergency response plan established protocols for timely communication. I, I, for one, I feel like that's pretty vague. Uh, I'm not sure what timely communications, what you're really referring to. Um, there to the protocols clearly, but I'm just trying to understand specifically what emergency response plan we're talking about because I know when the high school and maybe I'm my memory is failing me tonight, but when the high school presented, um, I'll just be frank and say it seemed like we didn't really have a concrete emergency plan and that was one of the things that they had brought up that we really need to work on as a district so I'm a little confused as how we're presenting a policy for something that we may not fully have developed yet and how um, we're communicating that out in real time to people yes yeah, so uh, first of all the, this policy refers to the emergency operations plan emergency plans that we have to submit to the state every September okay um, they are extensive uh, we go through a process of revision each year with them uh, they are your big binder plans if you will okay. uh, covering everything from tornadoes to um, plagues to school shootings so um, they are meant to um, to to outline a lot of different protocols given any particular emergency event um, when the high school admin presented, I think that was particularly in response to the communication piece of the plan mm -hmm. and in relation to an incident that occurred with the high school. So I think the wording around timely communication was only meant to emphasize that um, the, as a policy, we want to make sure that any communication that goes out is, is timely, um, meaning it is um, not delayed. Right, so it, the question had been raised from the board about in, incorporating communication a communication plan into the emergency response plan so what this is talking about is that part of the plan has to include a communication plan okay that's not clear to, to me okay. as a reader but maybe I'm just a very tired reader tonight but that's not clear to me here okay I think may I weigh in on yes this? we yeah. did we yeah. did discuss this quite a bit in the policy um, committee and I think that what my understanding of it was that that there are, multi, as Steve said, there are multiple response plans, each of, on different subjects, and, and we did want to make sure that each plan incorporated um, incorporated some protocols for communication. So, so this is, is a very general statement because each plan might need its own uh, timeline for what is determined timely communication. Right. So it's hard to be very specific in this policy okay. because it it it, uh, it affects Policy many others. multiple right, right. policy. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. that's helpful to understand. Thank you, Pat. Liz. Um, regarding uh, this policy and then uh, the couple other policies that were moved uh, to to bring forward. Um, just clarity. I know we don't want to take up board time, but I had already sent this in. Um, the sentence that Hope just quoted, it's not supposed to be established, it's supposed to be establishes right. with an S instead of a D. Um, 
the, we all, it also talks about September 1st that the plan is unchanged, but then the last sentence says, um, you know, and obviously there's a sentence that was removed, but I, I do think that last sentence probably should be the first sentence of that paragraph. Um, that, well, I mean, we, up, you know, we guide the superintendent to update the policy. It's sort of, it's kind of redundant. It kind of doesn't go together, but either way, I think it's fine. I think we just need to take rid of, get rid of the D, put an S, and then um, the, the first sentence of that paragraph, it says, in consultation with appropriate personnel, comma, and in coordination with local emergency authorities. You don't need that comma right there because I think it's, and it's the same thing for that second paragraph because you're saying the superintendent in consultation with appropriate personnel and in, co in coordination with local emergency authorities shall develop. So not the superintendent and local authorities shall develop, but the superintendent in consultation that, so we need to get rid of that comma right there. And, you know, I hate to be a stickler, but I, I do think that um, some of these things mean different things when you have a comma out of place. Um, and then my other comment is the school safety policy, EBB, that first one. I had asked that uh, second paragraph, um, second paragraph needs to have uh, after, before it goes into this list of things, it needs to, uh, say something like the safe schools plan will include and then the list of things because the list of things is sort of out of place without um, prefacing it with you know why we're listing these things we're listing these things because the plan needs to include all of these things um, we thought we did make that change yeah so. I, I don't I mean I sent it in but obviously I wasn't there so we did um, make it, it's just not reflected in this copy for some reason. Okay. okay, and then let me just double check while I have the mic here. Um, on the EJCA, um, uh, it looks like the formatting was changed. The only issue that we're still looking at is, um, or an issue that we're still looking at, um, is uh, a couple typos there. Uh, and. So procedure, if we're looking at A1A, it says described in four below, so that should be A, A1D. Um, yep. So I think there's some, uh, there's some uh, grammatical stuff in there, but my only other point to this is I hope that we could, you know, and I had said, expressed this last time, that I hope that we could express particularly what best interest is. Um, I know that it says best, students' best interest after taking in consideration, da 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 but we don't have any statement in here of what actually is best interest, and I don't know if that's in the statute. I know, you know, in, in child abuse protocols, we talk about best interest of the child, and it's clearly defined in statute. I just think that we probably should clearly define what best interest is, because I could say, oh, it's in my child's best interest for them to excel at this place, but, you know, superintendent could think otherwise. And so... I, you know, I understand it's sort of a term of art, but I think that we probably should be a little bit better about about defining those terms of art um, instead of like constantly repeating them and not not defining what exactly what they are. So, those are my comments on that. Other comments about the policies? So, if I could speak just to make sure we're clear on the vote, um, the um, so I, I would say to Liz's comments, um, what you could do is consider passing these policies with the edits as as the edit edits were described mm -hmm. um, the more substantive comments I, I would I would want to clarify that in the case of best interest that is by definition almost a subjective term and so it is up to the determination of um, the school district uh, and it is as described in the New Hampshire School Board Association model policy so th that is something that guides our discussion when we address but those are just samples right Steve I mean they, they are samples they're not explicit policies as the way that New Hampshire School Board Association has explained it to me yeah, they, they are their model. They call them model policies, okay. so they're not meant to be. Um, um, obviously, you can take and adapt them, but they have put the legal thought into them. Okay, thank you. So we're ready to move to roll call vote with, with the um, addendum I, of uh, grammatical it, edits suggested at tonight's meeting. Yeah, I just have one more edit. I think it's under number, so it's B. 
uh, B3. Are we on? This is JCA. Sorry, Which yeah, uh, the last one there. Um, J L JCA. JCA. Yeah, it's B3. And it's just, it should say two. So request to reassign the student to another public school. So not, there shouldn't be a comma. It should be to another public school, public academy. I think that's what we're getting at, but I think that changes the meaning a little bit and or makes it more yep. clear. Yep. Okay. Okay, so. Oh, Carrie, sorry. I Sorry, just wanted to jump in. Not, I, and I agree with all these changes and uh, I'm supportive of them. I just, I feel, I feel like we're at a loss with um, Liz having such great attention to detail and not being able to make the policy meetings. And as we've said, like these can these can be flexible. I'm just wondering if it might be in the board's best interest to um, try to make that recommendation to policy. If she'll consider staying on it. Yeah, Liz is still on the policy committee. We 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 haven't. We are working on finding different meeting times. It just didn't work for this week's meeting time, but we are okay. trying to incorporate that. Yeah, good point, Carrie. Totally. Other okay. Are we, we ready for a roll call vote? <clears throat> All right. Okay. Um, Liz Barrett. Yes. Pip Clues. Yes. Lisa Rappaport? Yes. Ann Walker? Yes. Margo Peabody? Yes. Nancy Clayberg? Yes. Hope Van Epps? Yes. Brian French? Yes. Carrie Nolte? Yes. Motion. I just want to say I appreciate the um, input that Liz has, and Pip always has done that too. So it's good to have somebody that's really looking at these with a fine tooth comb. So thank you, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to new business. Um, we have consideration and approval of the administrator contracts. Yeah, so you have in front of you a slate of administrative nominations. The, these represent all of our current administrators. <laughs> uh, we would intend to offer a contract to for next year. Uh, absent, of course, our two retiring administrators. Uh, up for your vote. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? Great. Roll call vote. Liz Barrett? Yes. Pip Clues? Yes. Lisa Rappaport? Yes. Ann Walker? Yes. Margot Peabody? Yes. Nancy Clayberg? Yes. Hope Van Epps? Yes. Brian French? Yes. Carrie Nolte? Yes. Okay, next up we have consideration and approval of employment, employment, employment of the new athletic director position for the yeah. Portsmouth School Department. Yes, we wanted to call this out uh, individually, of course. Uh, we are very excited to, first and foremost, um, bring back into the fold the position of athletic director in the district. And we've enjoyed a wonderful partnership with the rec department for many years. But um, we also would hope to envision what athletics and broader student wellness can become K-12 in this district. And uh, our own athletic director will be key to helping us uh, guide that path. Um, we're very excited. We had a committee uh, that went through the process in interviewing and selecting and uh, unanimously uh, would endorse um, the nomination of Tom Kazakowski as our athletic director. Uh, Kaz, as he goes by, uh, as you know, I'm sure, has worked with us for many years uh, now uh, in the capacity in the athletic office. Um, not only has uh, the great respect of students and of staff, but is also one of the most highly respected athletic directors in the state already. So we're very excited to bring uh, the nomination of Tom Kazakowski to you. I need a motion to move to approve. Yes. Second. Great. Roll call vote. Uh, Liz Barrett? Yes. Pip Clues? Yes. Lisa Rapport? Yes. Ann Walker? Yes. Margo Peabody? Yes. Nancy Clayberg? Yes. Hope Van Epps? Yes. Brian French? Yes. Carrie Nolte? Yes. Do you want to introduce the leave of absence? Yeah, so um, maybe we could take the next two together. They're both requests for leaves of absence. Uh, one, Linda Beal, uh, our new Franklin reading specialist, and the other, Betsy Keller Horn, uh, our ESOL Spanish teacher at the high school, uh, for the reasons they've expressed in their letters. Um, we. 
are in the middle of the hiring season, so would anticipate being able to post and hire for these two positions as a, as a one-year position and would support their requests for a leave of absence. Motion I make a motion to approve these two um, leave of absence, leave of absences. Second. Leave of absence. <laughs> no one can talk <laughs> Perfect. Uh, With grammatically correct. Liz Barrett? I, I guess, can we have a quick, just, just a quick oh, yeah. discussion? Sorry. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, as far as a reading specialist goes, you know, given we're in COVID and we're sort of dealing with a lot going on, is there any understanding that we need to go ahead and hire? I mean, this isn't a situation where we're going to move around teachers from first grade classroom to second grade classroom. Um, you know, are we? No, we would intend to hire absolutely for this position. George could probably. Actually, I think uh, <laughs> there might be some other reading specialists in house looking right. to step out of the classroom, which we would backfill that way. So we have, uh, at least that is a possible plan for New Franklin. If there are other reading specialists in the building um, serving other roles that might serve fulfill Linda's role. Okay. But okay. the position's not going away. Right, right. right. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? Roll call vote. Ms. Barrett? Yes. Pip Clues? Yes. Lisa Rappaport? Yes. Ann Walker? Yes. Margot Peabody? Yes. Nancy Clayburn? Yes. Hope Van Epps? Yes. Brian French? Yes. Carrie Nolte? Yes. Great, the motion passes. Uh, now we have consideration and approval of a set of policies that are up for first reading. So, um, so these three policies that you have in front of you um, actually are all up oh, for a single, single read because um, they are, um, and Nathan can speak to the first one. Uh, we've, we've worked for a while to, um, to correct a policy in relation to, um, to financial audit findings, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to yeah. Nathan to so describe this. The policy <laughs> DAF uh, uh, is uh, federally mandated. It speaks to all of our uh, all of our work with federal funds, uh, and the changes that are uh, recommended here uh, came from uh, again model policies from the New Hampshire School Boards Association. But that comes from guidance uh, echoed by the uh, New Hampshire Department of Ed from the U.S. Department of Ed. Uh, the biggest, I think, piece is uh, domestic preference by, by American. Uh, it's called by American with uh, reference to the food service programs uh, in this language. It's called uh, domestic preference uh, with regard to other purchases. It doesn't say that we must buy anything necessarily, only that if all things are equal, a domestic preference has to, has to be uh, considered. Um, and so this, I don't know that we have much choice. The language, if you if you look deep into the, the what is it, the 18th or 19th page, something like that, um, there's a whole lot of procedural that speaks to sub-award review and, and that process, and that's all prescribed by UNCLE, so. Yeah, and, that, and that's the case for all three of these policies. The only changes that are being made are changes that are, that have to be made to align with the latest RSAs. Um, I'll take a motion to, do we need to, to approve, approve them as a, group? As a bulk? Yeah, thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Great. Any discussion? I guess, I guess I'm wondering if there's any practical effect on this. I mean, obviously we're just talking about the policy, but while we have it in front of us, I'm wondering if there might be any practical effect as far as use of ESSER funds um, in, you know, uh, abiding by this uh, by American policy or domestic preference uh, if you Should don't be getting American if you, machines and if not you machine don't machine? abide if you don't abide by it they'll claw back all the money and have to pay it back later so is there I mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> these are the things that keep me awake at night <laughs> so, so uh, you know the best we're still talking about how to best address this and one one suggestion has just been to in, uh, include now language that addresses this on every purchase order that's issued Okay. So that the so that the standard, the standard expectation is out there. It would not be the first time that we've had to add particular language to everything we do to meet uh, uh, federal expectations. So uh, your your question, concern, well founded. I mean, these are this is already it's already law. So we're just reflecting it now in our in our local policy. 
Okay, so does this shadow, this policy actually shadow whatever policy the city is using? Like, does this, did the city update their policies surrounding this as well? Um, you know, I guess I can't. We're ahead I, of the curve, I guess. I, right I can't, I can't tell you. I mean, okay. this, this very much speaks to our IDEA funds, our, our consolidated Title I, Title II, Title III. I mean, that's, that's what this is speaking to for us. Um, ESSER is a, is a unique kind of one-time reality. And it has some additional uh, restrictions or, or requirements that are attached to it. Uh, I know the, the city's got the community block grants. They've got any number of things. And I don't know, I don't know how their language plays out. Because I don't know that this is a, a generic federal thing. This is very much for the educational environment. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. OK. Any other discussion? And roll call vote. Uh, Liz Barrett. Yes. Pip Clues. Yes. Lisa Rappaport. Yes. Han Walker. Yes. Margo Peabody. Yes. Nancy Clayberg. Yes. Hope Van Epps. Yes. Ryan French. Yes. Harry Nolte. Yes. I did have one question. It oh. doesn't affect the vote. Oh. Great. Go ahead. <laughs> um, Nathan, I'm just curious on the on I know that the sub recipient monitoring has really changed and I see that from my grant perspective and I know that we've talked about the financial the staffing of your office and your team um and just curious if this puts like a greater burden um on you because I know that a lot of folks are struggling with this compliance yeah I this is uh Everything that this does, or all of all of the sensitivity that this, uh, and again, it's already it's already upon us. The fact is, the policy is changing now. But um, when Steve mentioned we had our federal federal uh, fiscal monitoring annual some of our federal review, I don't know monitoring review. There's two words there. It wasn't an audit. It was just a, a you know a, a polite visit. Um, <laughs> they cited us for having policies not up to date, but they also tagged uh, a couple of salaried not salaried but wages. Uh, transactions that weren't documented according to the time and effort standards. Uh, we had mm -hmm. documented it, but our our process didn't didn't meet the, the standard in terms of the specific language that should be on the timesheet. So we've had to modify that and then write a new procedure to go with it. And um, and so yeah, it clearly is <laughs> all of these things. Every time somebody says I'm going to give you money, I cringe a little bit because it's, it's always on the chat. But I will say. Um, <clears throat> The accountant position, when filled uh, well, will will help to no end because this will be one of the things that, in in working mm -hmm. on compliance issues with the federal funds, that'll they'll be very much involved. I and I just want to put out an offer there, Nathan, that like a lot of this is what I've experienced with my grants in the last year, and so um, there might be some changes, especially on vendor subcontracts and yep. recipients that I might be able to help you with just to see how other. Uh, another place has brought that into compliance. Add Carrie Nolte yeah, to. Did I hear you? you're signing up, Carrie? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I love this stuff. <laughs> you know. God bless her. Anyway, let me know if I can help. <laughs> Carrie. Uh, thanks, Carrie. Uh, okay, now we wanted to talk about a redistricting committee. Form. Yeah, uh, and realizing it's about 10 o'clock, so I, you know, <laughs> this is not meant to be an in-depth discussion here tonight. Uh, we put it on the agenda only to raise awareness uh, and to say this is something we likely will be talking about in the near future. Um, and as referenced uh, when Nathan did his presentation, um, while our demographic projections most recently don't project an increase in elementary population, we are facing a growing imbalance between our three elementary districts. So uh, to put it bluntly, uh, we are, you know, we, we've really expanded at Dondero and we've really shrunk at Little Harbor. And uh, to the point where um, working with Principal Callahan, you know, based on number of sections, you know, there's conversation about do we need to take over the, the music room and put it as a classroom. I mean, there, there's at that point where uh, we may need to find one more classroom and we don't have one more classroom to find kind of thing. Um, New Franklin's always been cramped for space, um, but the real latest trends have been more around Dondero and Little Harbor. So um, it's not anything that we would be tart teeing up for a change for next year, um, but it is something that I would recommend the board consider a study committee of some sort 
Um, we can come into all the data on the last 5, 10, 15 years of population uh, trends, enrollments in the schools, et cetera. I think it would be smart to bring the planning department in the city in, uh, really understand where developments are going to impact schools. Uh, we've done all we can do to tinker, if you will, around the edges of the zones. So, for example, when a, when a, um, a development comes on that is sort of in between, we've tried to strategically move that. So the West End Yards, for example, to Little Harbor, because that's where there's space, right? So, um, but um, that's not going to be enough. So I think this is something that will probably be a work, uh, a body of work over the next, I'd say, maybe six months. Uh, that hopefully would come back to the board with some kind of uh, recommendation, which, by the way, could include a lot of things. It doesn't have to necessarily just include a, a, sh um, a shuffle of the boundary between elementary schools. It could include other other creative thoughts into how basically we could deal with um, with space at the elementary level and uh, and making sure that we can have um, adequate space for for all schools, all kids. So. Um, again, not for a decision point tonight, um, maybe certainly to, to raise any questions you may have about the process, but then to just sort of put it on the radar that, you know, this is something that probably should come back next to the board with maybe a draft of what a study committee could look like mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, excuse me, Steve. Um, do we know if there's anything already that the city has on the books from the planning board or otherwise for projected numbers um, based on demographics and within zip codes? Yeah, nothing that would specifically say uh, pupil impacts on schools, but we've worked with the planning department in the past to at least try to um, forecast that. Uh, the city has a new planning director. We would like to um, re-engage that discussion for sure um, because certainly there are things out there that you could um, put into some formula for for likely impact. Um, you know, not uh, you know. There's a lot of development out there. Not all of it would necessarily contribute to increased elementary school student population, but that can be that's part of the study. Right. That's part of my question. Right. Is do they would have building numbers? Do we would be able right. to have a better understanding of what we're building? That, that the demographic we're building right. for. Right. 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 Any other comments? Great. Okay. So we move on to we move on to committee updates. So anybody had a committee meeting that they care to? Do we? Share sorry. Do we need a motion to establish this committee that Steve is that requesting? I think that might be the next uh, an upcoming meeting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good question, uh, Liz, and then Pip. Uh, just a futures update. Carrie was on there, um, so maybe she can add a little bit more. But um, I'm just looking at the uh, director's report, and it looks like um, that eighth grade applications for the futures program um, to help uh, students who um, have been successful that are in, have income needs um, uh, work towards college and then attend college um, after high school. Uh, eighth grade applications are due uh, Friday, um, April 22nd, so that's coming up. Um, and I know Jenny um, uh, Tyberski, uh, the coordinator for Futures, she was working with Portsmouth Housing Authority and uh, Great Bay Community College to have an event there. I believe they may have already had that. Um, or it may be coming up. Um, so that sounded like a, a good opportunity. So she's definitely networking to um, get more students in the program and also to raise more funds for the program as well. Um, and that's the update, unless Carrie has more to add. I didn't take good notes for that one. And the other thing is um, New Hampshire Gives is coming up and that's important for futures. Um, so hopefully board members can promote that and then promote the other um, funds that the school department has and F Futures is looking for um, matching donors if anyone has any thoughts on um, folks that might haven't been interested but want to meet it's near and dear to their mission or vision. Great. Thanks. Pip and then Hope. Um, I attended the uh, CTE committee um, meeting in March and um, there was a lot of good news out of that. Um, one is that uh, 
um, they received a grant for $40,000 of new equipment for the relatively new um, health science technology program. So that's very exciting. And they've actually applied for yet another grant um, of almost $30,000 and are waiting to hear back on that one. So um, they also reported many partnerships that were working out very well with hosp local hospitals, um, possibly one with the fire department um, and uh, other um, health-related institutions in the area. Um, one thing they mentioned was that the, the costs for the culinary program are increasing significantly mm -hmm. with the increase in food costs. So um, it's nice that we have some money coming in to offset that a little bit. And then um, they also completed a needs assessment survey which um, came back with some very glowing reports on the teachers in that department um, and a lot of positive feedback and then um, some identified needs for more programs in the trades um, and and other areas like aeronautics and aviation and um, many many other ideas um, so uh, you should probably already have received one invitation and then there's another one I'll tell you about but the first is to the Health Science Technology Program's Ribbon Cutting and Open House. That's on April 20th at 2.30. Um, and then the other one is the annual CTE Awards Ceremony on May 19th at 5.30 in the PHS gym. What was the date of that again, Pat? The second May. one? May yeah. 19th. Thank you. Very impressive. Yeah, they're doing some great work. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Hope, did you have? Yeah, I just had a quick one. So um, the Safe Water Advisory Group from the City of Portsmouth, I sit on that representing the school district. Um, and they're going to be hosting their first water form on May 3rd from 6 to 8 in the City Council Chambers here. It's going to be an introduction of the water systems overview. Um, our water quality and they're going to be discussing contaminants of concern of PFAS and lead talking about um, resources that the community has and um, then doing some interactive polling so I just wanted to bring people's attention to that uh, since it's their their first form great thank you mm -hmm. are there committee updates Okie dokie. Um, would anybody like to make a request for a future agenda item or comment about a future agenda item? If I could um, establish a list um, based on our discussions tonight and people can add or subtract. Um, let's add the field trips, the discussion about the field trips. Um, can we add um, changes in the policy procedure, you know, the procedure that we use at our policy committee? I guess that should start at the policy committee level, but just to keep it on the radar, um, we can put it as a future agenda item. And then redistricting, creation of a redistricting committee. Um, I mean, that doesn't happen, have to happen tomorrow, but soon. Um, so let's put it on the future items so that we know that um, it'll, it, it, won't, it won't get lost. And then, you know, we had talked about the, the discipline for K through 12. I don't know how people feel. Do we have to add that now, or can we assume that we will cover that? after we finish our um, discussion with the high school. No, the board members that feel out. that we can do that. Yeah. We could add um, <coughs> disciplinary procedures for K through 12. I think we had said we were gonna, um, you and I could sit down and put together a okay. work session schedule, work that in, okay. looking at when the policy meetings are and when the board meetings are to work in those other levels so that it would better align and move the conversation forward. Okay. So and we'll report our, back. Kind of work set Next Thursday, why don't board members send Margo and me suggestions of people they would like to have come that night? Somebody mentioned a police officer, so I think that would be a good idea. Um, and we'll just have stakeholders come and talk to us on Thursday. So if you have any ideas of who you would like on the committee, let Margo and I know, and we can um, get the ball rolling on inviting those people. Great. Carrie has her hand up. Oh, Carrie? One, I'm, I was just curious and um, about having a transition to a, a new um, superintendent and 
kind of what the onboarding process is and the involvement of the board as mm -hmm. are the employer of the so I don't know if that's a future agenda or uh, what it is. Um, well, I've been in, so Zach actually got in touch with me and asked me to send him um, all board member um, um, contact information. So emails and phone numbers. He said that he would like to start with contacting board members. So he said he'll either call or email, um, you know, in the next couple of weeks um, just to get to know the board members. Hope and I had a, a nice conversation today and she had drawn up a list of other stakeholders that she thought he, he she and Margo actually because they were the search committee people. Um, she she came they came up with a nice list of other contact people that he may want to come up with uh, get in contact with all the principals the um, um, oh there were there were many people they, uh, Kathleen Dwyer um, Tom Clawson you know all people that he would be working with so hope's going to send off that email and say you know when when at your leisure at least here's the list and uh you know do do as you feel you would like to do with this list so we, you know we've reached out to him um i've also i also told him you know if he came to portsmouth i would love to have a gathering at my house where our school board members could come with their spouses and we could just have a social gathering with him so perhaps we'll do that so yes, we have reached out to him um, in the past, I would say the past month um, to ask him, you know, what, what is the best procedures for him? And we have done that action, we, you know, we've taken that action so far, so. So I'm just, I'm just curious, I know this is an awkward question. I'm used to nonprofits where the board really drives that orientation um, in a very, like scheduling it, et cetera. So if, or to receive either of you have thoughts or comments on kind of what you see happening or what the board could do to be helpful in that? Yes, I think that's a great idea. And I think, you know, we're waiting to hear from him about how he would like to do that. Like Pope and I were talking today, she said, what does he do on July 1st? Does he just walk into the office and sit down and start his job? <laughs> so, you know, we talked about it for a minute Thank and I said, well, it'd probably be nice if, if a couple of school board members were there and he can't have more than four, obviously, but then maybe another couple of other school board members could take him out to lunch or, you know, we can, we'll work all that out when, um, as we get closer to the date. But yes, we need to work on that. Okay. Um, Marga. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just gonna add, as far as a couple other agenda items, uh, we had the school board meeting uh, list from Steve. I meant to sort of create a discussion around, or I was gonna propose um, not actually going to these different locations because I think in the past there's been recording issues and uh, logging in issues to be able to make the meetings public and so, I think there's a better way we can see our schools versus holding meetings there. But um, so as far as the dates and locations, if we could put that on the next agenda to adopt the meeting schedule. Um, and then I also guess I just wondered, you know, Nate gave this great presentation tonight and I guess it just is not clear to me, you know, is this gonna be another agenda item or should be an agenda item for next time to vote on if we're gonna put money towards, um, you know, these considerations. Um, what is the next step for this, I guess? And so um, we, I'm assuming we need to take a vote and if we have, you know, all these uh, numbers and, um, and need to get this out for bid, um, I would assume that we probably need to take some action on these ESSER fund things sooner than later. So I'd rather not could just continue to sit on these things. Um, so uh, maybe. I, I, I guess I, if I can respond yeah. just quickly, I don't want to interrupt, but I, there are some things there that I think Will become it will become necessary for there to be. I, I don't know that the board necessarily needs to take a vote or take action, but I think it's cleaner if you do. For instance, if we're going to have uh, an outdoor ed person, if we're going to have a social worker, if we're going to have, well, we hired a social worker, thankfully. But it, these things that you want to have happen, based on this proposal for FY23, and want us, obviously, those are things that you need to. We need to at some point in the next month or so, maybe longer if you, or later if you prefer, but we need to come to some sense that yes, those things we're definitely gonna do and call them out and then start to move on them. But I don't know that the entire plan has to be called out because things continue to change and some of this wants to be dynamic as you, as you keep moving forward. Excuse me, Nathan, um, would it 
not seem to be beneficial to wait until our budget is approved by the city because we do have some things stacked in there yep. yeah. that should they strip them we would be having to look potentially two ESSER dollars and see if they would meet the requirements so That's I good. certainly would feel more comfortable knowing where we stand with our budget but continuing to have the conversation gets us ready so that when the budget's approved right. and we say, yeah, so let's go on this and go on that. Um, I think the, ca the capital things don't have to be decided now. Those capital things will want to be decided, let's say, by September, October, so that we can go through the process of getting on the schedule and bid it out for the next year. Um, if we come to conclusion that we've decided what we want to do sooner, then obviously whenever the board says, we're definitely doing that, good, then we'll operationalize it. But. but I guess that's my concern is that we're sort of you're, you're you, I don't want the school to re completely rely on us as far as us determining when the best time to go is I mean maybe the best time to go on these AC units was a year ago but there wasn't any sort of concrete thing so now we don't have AC this summer for the kids that would be beneficial with these COVID funds and could help with learning loss da 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 da, da. so I guess I'm I guess at the next meeting regardless of where the budget stands if there's things on here that we need to go ahead and and get rolling so that we can get them implemented for the summer then I think we may be looking to Steve and 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 you Nate and you know whatever we could sort of think up um, I'd, I'd rather get rolling on it sooner than later if we need to implement before summer so Thank you. Put that on there. I'll put that on the agenda. It'd be great. Got it. Um, I think we covered upcoming events, but any other additions besides the ones that were announced tonight? State testing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably not a good time. Um, it's, uh, we talked about calendar adjustments already. Did anybody else have any other calendar comments that they wanted to make? We noted the November 8th. The potential for the November 14th change. Lisa? Don't have the date of this, but Hope says every year, please don't schedule a board meeting on the night of the all district chorus concert in oh, you know, yes. December. Yes. I don't know what date that is, but. Okay, they already have that on the count. We'll have to check with the performing yeah. arts department. <laughs> Good point. Noted. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Or do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Great. <laughs> have a great night. Let's get out of here. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you.